Right, welcome to this codex review for Necrons, brand new Necron codex here, uh, very kindly sent out ahead of time by Games Workshop. So uh, in this video here, I'm going to run through the entire codex and it'll be a review of all of the units that are available, uh, points, points changes, stratagems now, warlord traits and all of those details. And it's going to be tactical as well, so we're talking about tactics. I have Necrons, really want to see them do well. Uh, I think they have struggled in 8th edition. I've struggled using them uh, and hopefully the codex here uh, will be an improvement. It seems to be the trend at the moment. A new codex comes along, it's usually a big improvement uh, for each of the factions. And hopefully that's the case here for the Necrons. So uh, check out the channel. There's loads of Necron battle reports. They've been on the channel for a long time. Um, they were an army to be feared. They've struggled in 8th edition here on the channel anyway, uh, but they were an army to be feared for sure. Very tough, very resilient in previous editions. Uh, you'll see that in a number of the games and uh, they were one of the top armies, but they have been struggling. So uh, really looking forward to reviewing the codex here and then working on a new Necron list. Uh, maybe adding in some new units, but really want to try and make them work and perform well on uh, the channel. So. Uh, as I said, Games Workshop sent me this out. Usually I get mine from GamingFigures.com. Uh, they do Games Workshop at a discounted rate, just means you can get a hold of your Games Workshop stuff at a reduced price. And then Gaming Figures, they do loads of different gaming systems uh, as well, uh, all available from them. So, just the usual quality here for the Codex is very, very nice indeed. Uh, great artwork on the front, very iconic there with the Necron Overlord and the Resurrection Orb just there. Great looking pieces of artwork here as the Necrons fight against the Eldar. They're great arch enemies of all different uh, factions uh, in 40k. It's great to fight against the Necrons and to try and grind them down, but they are it, sort of, uh, it's maybe one of the tougher armies, one that's very tough and hard to get rid of. And in games that we've played often found that they uh, they take casualties at the start and you think they're losing and then they make a late surge at the end and that's when they uh, achieve victory and that's happened a lot of times on the channel, it's sort of a late surge sort of army. Other armies, maybe sort of Glass Hammer, Dark Eldar and so on, um, armies like that, uh, Tyrians perhaps as well, where they start strong and then uh, they get hit hard and then they just melt away. Necrons, different, often stronger towards the end of a game, it's an interesting aspect to those. Some nice artwork here at the start, giving you an idea of the kind of colour scheme. If you're looking for inspiration uh, for painting these, maybe you're watching this and you've, you're considering Necrons, but you don't actually collect them at the moment. That's the kind of sort of the neon green colours here, uh, the rusty, grimy, ancient look to the metal as well. You, you don't want a sort of factory clean finish of Necrons, they're meant to be a really ancient race. So, sort of old, weathered look there on the metal. Uh, there's a full painting tutorial. If you like the way my Necrons look, there is a tutorial for them on the channel uh, here, so you can check that out and see how I paint them up pretty quick, actually, for Necrons. So if, if you're looking for an army that's quick to paint, but a great effect, then I would recommend Necrons, especially if you're starting into 40k and maybe a bit intimidated by painting, then I would recommend the Necrons for sure. Uh, so introduction here. Right, here's this piece of artwork. Very atmospheric, incredible fight taking place here between the Necrons and the Eldar. Two ancient races battling it out. And you see the neon green effect here of the Necrons as well. It's, that's the, it's the standard Necron, this colour scheme here. It's the standard Necron colour scheme I've gone for uh, with my army. I do, I'm, I'm, just, I'm racking my brain just trying to work on a list for them. I do like the idea of hordes of these mindless machines here marching through. Just this unrelenting, and then the, the reconstruction themselves. I love the reanimation protocols idea, so I really like that. Mm, it's pretty difficult though, they're quite expensive in points though, as you'll see. Let's talk about the Necron Legions here in the beginning. Great Awakening. This is the different dynasties here, just like Space Marines have different chapters. This is the different dynasties that you can choose. So, neon green, yes, or you can go for. Uh, different colour schemes here. This is where they are in the universe, the Awakening Empire. Dominion of the Pharaons, this is their organisation here. Dynastic markings. Interesting. Look at all this, really helpful stuff. So, yeah, 
it's the this is my dynasty I suppose this one here the Sal Tech dynasty if you're gonna go by the the artwork but we'll see which of the different uh, dynasties is best later on Mefrit dynasty just here see with the orange they come with these green rods here but I've heard that you can go on eBay or somewhere similar and buy different colored rods and cut them out and then change the actual color of your clear plastic uh, tubes there so I think it's a great idea <laughs> Orange there. Always liked that one with the gold on top. Just there. Nice glowing blue. Another really good colour scheme just there. So great. New epoch begins. Obviously, the updated storyline for these bring them up to date. A classic piece of artwork here. And that that's. Um, if you go back on the channel, one of the oldest battle reports and one of the most viewed is Necrons vs Ultramarines. Total classic game. Always really enjoy playing this one. Really good in that sort of city fight terrain. Um, that's one of our earliest earliest battle reports and one of the most viewed was that matchup. No, Necrons are great. Really good to have them. In 40k, I'm going to take the Stormlords, different characters here, Overlords and Lords. I can command barge, I haven't used that for a while, maybe bring that on back. Cryptex, also got the new one here that's available now. Luminal Xeris, Oracan the Diviner, Trazium the Infinite. Characters here. That kind of warriors, Immortals, Lich Guards, some great, great models, all in plastic now. Beautiful models. Death Marks, Tomb Blades, was a big fan of them in 7th. Destroyer Lords, Destroyers, Flayed Ones, Triarch Praetorians, not use them ever, possible units to take, Triarch Stalkers, Ghost Starks, amazing model that one, really nice, Annihilation Barge, and the Flyers, very iconic with the Flyers, beautiful model, Knight Sives and then Doom Sives, so the heavier firepower, and again another classic, the Sandwich Toaster. <laughs> Necron Monolith, very iconic for the Necrons. Um, dubious though, as to whether, questionable about the, uh, how effective it is, but it's just it's iconic for the Necrons. And the Doomsday Arc. Obelisk, this is the largest stuff here, Tesseract Bolts as well. Nice piece of artwork there, really cool. Canoptic Raves, plenty of uh, units to choose from. Spiders, Canoptic Scarabs, Catal Shards. Nightbringer, Deceiver, there's loads, loads of options. And then uh, your colour schemes then. Just here, so many special characters. These, uh, not him, but these ones here are going to be in uh, resin now. Uh, fine cast, which I'm not so keen on, but some great looking HQs just there. He's in plastic now with the Void Scythe. Nice looking model. And then uh, a great selection of alternate colour schemes to choose from here. They do look great in that colour scheme there. But there's uh, some different options available for them. But again, this standard colour scheme uh, with the technique that I show you in the video, it's nice and quick. So you can get a nice, the army looks nice. With the, with the technique, it's, it's very straightforward, just a process that you go through. Uh, but you can get a nice looking army pretty fast. So of all of the factions to paint up, I would say Necrons are one of the quickest, and yet a very strong theme. And they look great, especially when you have them in hordes legions of uh, lines and lines of them advancing forward something like that yeah it looks great the problem is the points going through the codex they are expensive it's hard to fill an army right out with necrons if you want if you want to go after vehicles as well then your army's not going to be too big which can be a bit of an issue because uh, you just get shot to bits so you got it's, it's been a real headache trying to work on a list i'm still working on a list for these at the moment uh, trying to get them to work well in 8th edition. In fact, I'll say it right here at the early stage, uh, if you are a Necron player and you've had success with the index and you've got a list that's worked, then by all means share that or what's worked well for you so that other newcomers here to this video can get an idea of lists that work well and I'll be fascinated to read through different lists as well to see what's worked well for you in the index. I struggle with Necrons but maybe you found uh, perhaps there's certain strategies that you've used, certain uh, unit builds and so on or even your whole entire army list and you say yeah this actually worked really well uh, for me. 
uh, with the index then share that, it'd be fascinating to read through because I'm still trying to come up with a list uh, that works well, hopefully. So I want to see the Necrons do well, to be that army that's feared. Once again, nice spread here, that's a, that is a beautiful army there. It really does look really nice. So legions of warriors, nice spread of different units and then some vehicles as well, it's a nicely balanced army. I don't know if that's about 2,000 points, but that's a powerful looking army, it looks nice. Really does look good, and there's the new Cryptek just there as well. Beautiful model. So Necrons, some fantastic models, and uh, an army that you could paint up really nice, really quick, and get out onto the battlefield. So, we are about two thirds of the way through the book here, that's all of the background information. So onto the rules now. Uh, I've been reading through this a lot, and I don't think there's too many changes here for the Necrons, but stratagems, you'd be fascinated by the stratagems that they have. Uh, some real enhancements, and I think it's the stratagems would be the key for the Necrons. There's some really good ones, in my opinion, some great stratagems, which we'll come to later on. Uh, but I'll treat this like a full codex review, so we're going to check out all the units, uh, weapons and upgrades and so on, points costs here listed at the back, uh, and then uh, some tactics as it comes up as well. So, quite straightforward then, you, you choose your dynasty and then uh, you, you swap out your keyword, you put the dynasty keyword in, in there, uh, and then you, you have to make sure that, that you, you keep, keep all the same in the detachment, and then uh, bonuses that are conferred, say from a character, you've got to make sure it's from one dynasty to the next, to the same one, uh, just the same as for the other codexes. Uh, reanimation protocols, I think this is modified slightly, roll a d6 for each slain model from this unit, Unless the whole unit has been completely destroyed, that's the same as normal, at the beginning of your turn. Do not roll for models that have fled the unit. So you've got to keep them separate. Now, I think that has changed. So any models that flee because of bad morale, you keep them to a side. They can never be reanimated. It's only models that have been killed uh, in combat or from shooting. On a 5+, plus, the model's reanimation protocol is activate and is returned to this unit with its full complement of wounds. Otherwise, it remains inactive, although you can roll again at the start of each of your subsequent turns. So... I love this idea for Necrons, I think it's one of the most powerful aspects is the ability for them to return back to be reanimated and come back to the fight. So I'm thinking like a list to really major on units that can do that. Just keep coming back, kill them, just keep coming back. When a model's reanimation protocols activate, set it up in unit coherency with any model from this unit that is not returned to the unit as a result of reanimation protocols this turn, and more than one inch from enemy models. If you cannot do this, then you don't, you're not able to set them up. And uh, then the other living matter which hasn't changed, at the beginning of your turn, this unit regains one lost wound. So units like uh, monoliths have living metal, uh, they regain a lost wound. That's the basic rules, not really changes just there, just need to remember to keep your uh, models that have fled separate and they can't be reanimated. So, Imitech the Stormlord, uh, tactics then here by the way, uh, it's a bit of a conundrum because you, you, if you go for small units, it's easy for the opponent to destroy the unit entirely and therefore you can't do reanimation. So then you want to go for bigger units, but then if you go for bigger units, there's the danger of morale. If the, you know, you've got a unit of 20, the opponent kills 10, that's going to, not going to be good for your morale when you roll it up. So you've got a difficult... Do you go for big units or small or medium sized? It's hard to know which to go for. Uh, Imitech the Stormlord then. Check out the uh, points values for these as we go along. So he's 200 points for him. Uh, so he's power level 10. I will mention the power levels here. Movement 5. This is your standard movement for Necrons. Weapon skill 2 plus. Ballistic skill 2 plus. Strength 5. Toughness 5. 6 wounds. 3 attacks. Leadership 10. 2 up save. So it's uh, great stat line for him. He's armed with the Staff of the Destroyer and a Gauntlet of Fire. Only one model per army. So Gauntlet of Fire, it's range 8, Assault D6, they're auto hits, Strength 4, AP 0 and 1 damage. So not that scary. Then Staff of the Destroyer, can shoot with it, it's Assault 3, range 18, maybe we'll be hitting on 2s. Strength 6, minus 3 and 2 damage, that's quite nasty. And then in combat, Melee weapon plus one strength, so you'll fight at strength six, minus three and two damage. So he's okay. You, let's say you mainly take these overlords and, and warlords for their bonuses that they grant. 
So he does have living metal, so each turn if he's lost a wound he'll re re automatically regain one. Phaeron of the Sautek Dynasty. Imitek the Stormlord may use his My Will Be Done ability, which we'll cover there, twice a turn, but only if you choose friendly Sautek infantry units to be affected by it both times. Cool. It's good. My Will Be Done is really good. Uh, Lord of the Storm, once per battle in your shooting phase, Imitek can call the Storm. Pick an enemy unit within 48, other than a character, or a d6. So on 2 plus, the unit suffers that many mortal wounds. Of course, cool, so it's between 2 and 6 mortal wounds. Then roll a d6 each time for each enemy unit within 6 of that unit on a 6. The unit being rolled for suffers d3 mortal wounds. It's not bad. And that's not bad, it can cause trouble there. That's not bad. And then undying, uh, he regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of the turn rather than one for living metal. So he's pretty solid. Yeah, it gets better here. So my will be done. We'll read this raw out here. At the beginning of your turn, you choose a friendly Necron's infantry unit within six. This is the idea of you having your HQs nearby and then your units all within this bubble here for the Necrons. Uh, add one to advance charge and hit rolls, so that's going to be a shooting and in combat for that unit at the beginning until the beginning of your next turn. A unit can only be chosen as a target of this ability once in each turn. So brilliant for shooting, you know, usually 3 plus goes up to 2 plus. If you've got mass ranks of firepower that's pretty deadly. Uh, combat as well, you charge in one of your elite units, uh, you go from 3 plus to hit in combat to 2 plus to hit, that's very very powerful. And then he gets to do it twice if it's units from the same dynasty, Sautek. Sort of. At uh, Blood Swarm Necro Scarabs, you can reroll hit rolls of one for friendly Satek Flayed Ones that are within 12 of the Stormlord. Interesting. And Grand Strategist, if your army is Battle Forged, you receive an additional command point if he is the Warlord and he has a 4 plus in one save with the Phase Shifter. So, for 200 points, I reckon he's solid enough. He is a good HQ. Light Tuck Look though. List of bonuses for him. He can stand up for himself in combat. His shooting's pretty good, and then he grants loads of bonuses. So I'd rate him. He is good. He's not my favourite model for the HQs, but uh, all in all, he is a very good HQ indeed. Right, Nemesaur Sudrek. I'll try my best <laughs> to pronounce these here. Uh, he's 180 points, he's a bit cheaper. Power level 9, movement 5, uh, stat lines exactly the same. So, same as before. 2 plus, strength type is 5, 6 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 10, 2 up, so. He's armed with the staff of light and only 1 per army. So, for shooting, it's range 12, assault 3, strength 5, minus 2, and 1 damage. So, significantly better uh, with the staff of the destroyer. The other tank just there. And then in combat, it's the same strength of the user, which is strength 5, minus 2, and 1 damage. Counter tactics. At the beginning of your opponent's turn, choose one enemy character within 12 of Nemesaur uh, Zandrek. Any aura abilities that character has cannot be used until the beginning of your opponent's next turn. Strange. Okay. Well, no, that's a, a trait that you could... Uh, it's an ability that you could easily forget, that one. And it's, you've got to get quite close, close to use it as well, range 12. He's got 4 plus in one. Uh, my will be done. Which again is for Soltec Infantry. Yep. Uh, Transient Madness. Roll a d3 at the beginning of your turn and consult the following table. Choose a friendly Soltec Infantry unit within 6 of, the ne of Nemesar uh, to gain the relevant ability until the beginning of your next turn. So it's random. Yeah, you can't choose, it's random. So number 1. On a D3, Avenge the Fallen, add one to the attacks characteristic of the models in this unit. Quell the Rebellion, improve the ballistic skill of models in this unit by one. Yeah, not too helpful this. Uh, solar Mills, charge, reroll foul charge rolls. Yeah, that's not very helpful because you have to choose a unit first. You say, right, okay, I, I, wanna, I want this unit here to do well in combat and then uh, you select a unit of Lich Guard with this, and then you roll a 2, and then they get pl 
Their ballistic skill improves. Great. <laughs> That's not very... The randomness there is a bit awkward. Yeah. Or you say, right, I've got this unit here that's really good at shooting, I want them to do better, and then you're a one, and it's plus one attacks. Great. So, you know, and his, his shooting's not as good, his weapon's not as good, just there. There's not as many bonuses. For the sake of 20 points, he's twice as good. Much better. Simitek, much, much better. So that's what I would go for. Uh, Vargard Obreon, power level 7, movement 5, weapon skill 2+, plus, ballistic skill 3+, plus, strength 5, toughness 5, 6 wounds, 4 attacks, nice lot of attacks, leadership 10, and 2 up save, he's armed with a war scythe, so be on plus 2 strength, he fights with strength 7, AP minus 4 and 2 damage, he's got 4 attacks, hitting on 2s, so he is pretty good, and he costs 140, so pretty cheap. Uh, he's living metal, and then cleaving counterblow. Uh, Vargard is slain during the fight phase. Do not remove this model until the end of the phase. He can still fight uh, in this phase if he has not already done so. So he always gets to fight there, which is great. Then uh, the Lord's Will reroll wound rolls of one for friendly Saltek infantry units within six of Vargard. So reroll wounds of one. Pretty helpful. That's for shooting and for combat. It's not bad. Ghost walk. Mantle, he's pretty good here actually, and pretty cheap. Uh, Ghost Walk Mantle, at the end of any of your movement phases, you can remove Vargard, Obreon, and a friendly Saltic Infantry unit within six of him, uh, other than uh, Nemesaur, from the battlefield and set them up so that all models within six of Nemesaur, Xandrak, oh, you have to take the two, right? So he has to be somewhere on the battlefield, and more than one inch from enemy models. Pretty uh, good strategy that, but you need to have him, so you've got to get these two together in order to do that. But you can pull out a pretty clever trick. Uh, if you have him somewhere and then transport him over and then an infantry as well. Uh, Vargard's duty or D6 each time Nemesaur loses a wound whilst in three inches of Vargard. On a 2 plus, uh, Oberon can intercept that hit and uh, Xandrek does not lose a wound. Oberon suffers a mortal wound. So it's a good bodyguard as well. He's not bad, he's pretty cheap points. He's okay. But ideally, to get the most out of him, you need to take these two. Uh, together, and that can be if you total it up, it's quite expensive. HQ is taken again, your arm is just going to shrink down, which is the problem here. Yeah. Maybe for Necrons, I'd recommend like a, a, a decent HQ of some kind, and then maybe a cheaper HQ to try and offset the points. Maybe him, for example, and then some other cheaper HQ option. Right next is a Luminor Xeras. Next, so he is uh, power level 8. 143 points. Uh, so movement six, a bit quicker. Uh, weapon skill three plus, ballistic skill three plus, strength four, toughest four, five wounds, four attacks, leadership ten, the free up save. He's armed with the Eldritch Lance. For shooting, it's range 36, assault one, strength eight, minus four, and d6. So it's powerful that. Pretty good. And then in melee, it's strength for the user, which is strength four, minus two, and one damage. So not as good uh, in melee. He's living metal. And then Masto Technomancer, uh, add one to animation protocols for models from friendly Necrons units in three inches of Xerus. A unit cannot benefit from both the tech, from the Master Technomancer and Technomancer abilities in the same turn. Okay. And then. Oh, it's Necron. Okay, yeah, and then mechanical augmentation. At the end of your movement phase, you can choose a friendly Necron's Warriors or Immortals unit of an inch of zero. So roll a D3 to see what the characteristic modifier uh, is. So, the gain for the rest of the battle. Whoa, nice. Plus one strength. Yeah, you can only target unit once per battle. I was going to say you can't, <laughs> you can't keep stacking up the strength. It is only one uh, unit per turn. But still pretty good. Plus one strength on a one. A two is plus one toughness. And a three is ballistic skill improved by one. Okay. Not bad. Yeah, he's okay. And uh, he's medium sort of cost for points. Orican the Diviner is next. He's power level six. And it's 115 points. This is a cheaper HQ here. 
Uh, movement 5, 3 plus weapon skill and ballistic skill, strength 4, toughness 4, wounds 5, attacks 2, leadership 10 and a 4 up save. Uh, so armed with the stuff for tomorrow. Uh, then uh, there's another profile which I'll cover in just a moment. Uh, staff of the tomorrow is a melee weapon, it's strength user which is strength 4, AP minus 3 and D3 damage and you reroll hits for this weapon. It's got living metal, master uh, chronomancer, Sawtech infantry units within 6 of Orican, the diviner have a 5 plus invon saves, that is handy, very helpful. Add 1 to reanimation protocols for models from Sawtech units within 3 inches of any friendly Sawtech cryptex, a technomancer, and then the stars are right, roll d6 and start of each of your turns. If the result is less than the current turn round number, so on turn one you can't do it, turn two you need a one, then turn two you need a one or a two, or turn three you need a one or a two, you've got to roll under the turn number. Orican uses the Orican empowered profile for the rest of the game, so any damage he has sustained is carried over. So then he becomes two plus weapon skill and ballistic skill, strength seven, toughness seven, seven wounds, four attacks, leadership ten to four up save. For what you get, I think he's good value in points. It's unlikely he's going to get killed because of the character rules now, they're hard to target. So he's going to sit there for a few turns and then mid-stage of the game he's going to become really powerful. If you get that roll. And then that strength, uh, this weapon here, AP minus 3 and D3 damage, that becomes really powerful and it turns into 4 attacks from 2's to hit at strength 7. So he turns into very, very powerful. Yeah, really good. Interesting. Granting 5 plus invon save, plus 1 reanimation protocols. Now I would say he's a good HQ, a good deal there for 115 points. So that's a good one. And Rekiar the Traveller is next. He's power level 9. There's good plenty of HQ choices now for the Necrons. He's 167, sort of the medium sort of points cost. Movement 5, 2 plus weapon skill and ballistic skill, strength 6, toughness 5, 6 wounds. Free attacks, leaves you 10 and free up save. He's got the Tachyon Arrow and the War Scythe. So we know what the War Scythe is already. The Tachyon Arrow is a one shot only weapon once, one shot per game. Uh, it's 120 inch range, assault one, near two to hit, strength 10, minus five, and d6 damage. I mean, after all that, you could just end up rolling one for damage. So it's okay. Uh, Lord of the Fire and Legions. Add one to attacks, characteristic of friendly Necron infantry units, so three inches of him. Nice. If you're going to go real combat based army, plus one attacks, fantastic. And then uh, Mind in the Machine is next. The start of your shooting phase, choose an enemy vehicle within 12 inches of Enricar the Traveller, roll a d6. On a 4 plus, choose one of the weapons, one of the vehicle's weapons. You may shoot with that weapon at another enemy unit. The weapon fires using the vehicle's ballistic skill. Cool. It used to be, eh, it's not as good, I think it used to be, you just choose a unit, a vehicle, and the whole vehicle just fires everything. But it's just a weapon now. But it could be pretty good, I mean you could use that, take over a weapon from say a Bane Blade for example. <laughs> That'd be quite fun. Interesting, okay. Uh, phase Shifter, she's got a 4 plus M1, and then my will be done. At the beginning of your turn, choose a friendly Necron Infantry unit within 6 of him at one to advance charge. Oh, we've already covered that. Okay, so it's the usual rules. So he's okay. The tachyon arrows, I wouldn't say, is that great. Really, just a chance to cause d6 damage against something. You're not going to one-shot kill a vehicle with that. Uh, the plus one attack is good though. If you're going to go for a more combat base, so lich guard, triarch Praetorians, um, then consider him because he's going to really help them out with the extra attack. That really is cool. Yeah, and, and then the might will be done granting the plus one to hit. Wow. Yeah, so more combat based for that one. Uh, Trazian the Infinite is next. He's power level five. 100 points for him, so this is a cheaper HQ. Movement five, web skill two plus, ballistic skill two plus. Uh, Strength 5, toughness 5, 6 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 10 to 3 up, so. Uh, so he has the Empathic Obliterator, which is a melee weapon, plus 2 strength, so fight strength 7, AP minus 1, and D3 damage. If a character is slain by an attack from this weapon, each enemy unit within 6 of the slain character suffers D3 mortal wounds. 
strange. Okay, so that's an interesting result from that. And then living metal, phase shifter as well for him. My will be done, but it's for Nihilak infantry. And then surrogate hosts. The tragedy in the infinite is slain, roll d6. On a 2 plus, you may choose another friendly Necron's infantry character, other than characters that can only be included once in your army. Remove that model as if it was slain, and place Trazin in its place with d3 wounds remaining. If no such characters remain, or you roll a 1, remove Trazin the infinite as a ca casualty as normal. Yeah, cool. So that would work well against saying you take a. add a. A cheaper HQ and then take the place of him. But is there one? Because he's 100 points. He's, he's cheap anyway. Interesting. He's a bargain, really. 100 points. Interesting. Very interesting, that one. Very, very cheap. So the next one's the Catacomb Command Barge. I have this one here. Uh, I used to use it in 7th edition. Uh, and it, I raced it. It was okay. Uh, we'll just take it. Look at it now, it's power level 9, uh, starting at 138 points, and you've got to add your war gear on top of that. Uh, I used to like the idea where you could dismount the, the overlord, but it, you can't do that anymore. Um, he's stuck on the vehicle. Uh, it's armed with a gauze cannon, so you've got to pay an extra 20 points on top of that, so 158 points you're up to now. And then uh, it is ridden by an overlord armed with a staff of light. So then you, I guess, pay for the just the staff of light, not the extra overlord cost. And uh, staff of light is another 10 points. So sort of a medium, more expensive HQs here. But mm, it's eight wounds though, and quick. Yeah, I'm starting to like the look of this because with eight wounds, there's no damage bracket here. So this thing fights effectively as one of these characters, but quicker and a lot of wounds here. Eight wounds. This is a, this is one to consider here. Interesting. So power level nine, movement twelve. It's very very quick compared to these. Movement five, movement twelve. So very very quick indeed. Weapon skill, ballistic skill 2+, plus, strength 5, toughness 6 for him, 8 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 10 to 3 up save. Um, so you can get, take the Gauze Cannon, which is range 24, heavy 3, strength 6, minus 3 and d3 damage. And you're on 2s to hit with it. Nice. Uh, but you are a vehicle, if you move, uh, then you'll be on minus 1. Uh, yep. So you'll be on 3s to hit, which is still good. The Overlord may replace his Staff of Light with a Hyperphase Sword, a Void Blade, or a War Scythe. So, uh, Staff of Light then is, uh, we checked that, it was 10 points for that, I believe, Staff of Light. Yeah, 10 points. Uh, so for shooting, it's range 12, Assault 3, Strength 5, minus 2 and 1 damage, it's okay. And then in combat, it's Strength for the user, which is Strength 5, AP minus 2 and 1 damage. So not very high impact there. So instead, you can go for... The Void Blade, uh, which is 6 points, it's cheaper, uh, there's no shooting ability of that, gives you an extra attack, strength for the user, AP minus 3 and 1 damage, and still not that high impact with that. Um, so you can go for the Hyperphase Sword, which is plus 1 strength, so 5 strength 6, AP minus 3 and 1 damage, it's just basically plus 1 strength, it's the only difference. Uh, and that is 3 points, interesting. And then, yes, yeah, so you pay a lot more just to get the extra attack with the Void Blade. Um, and then you can go for the War Sight, which is going to kick out a lot more damage. It's probably the better option. And you're paying 11 points for that. That's probably the one I'd go for would be the War Sight. So he, he could take the Resurrection Orb, is available. And that's 35 points. It's expensive, but this is what it can do. If this model has a resurrection orb, once per battle, immediately after you've made your reanimation protocols at the beginning of the turn, you may make reanimation protocol rolls for models from a friendly infantry unit within three inches of this model. So you select the unit, it's not everyone within 
range and it's A friendly, infantry unit within three inches and you get to go again basically. So it could really help you out if there's a certain unit you want to recover well, do your reanimation protocols and you get to do it again and it's once per battle. Once per battle, yeah. Interesting. The Catacomb Command Barge can replace its Ghoul's Cannon with a Tesla Cannon. That's going to be Assault 3, Strength 6. There's no minus when you're doing your shooting. Uh, 6 pluses is 3 hits instead of 1. So good to saturate, potentially, cause more hits. But it's, there's no AP, it's, it's minus 0 and 1 damage. So I think the Ghoul's Cannon is much better. And the Tesla Cannon is 13 points. As opposed to 20. The Ghoul's Cannon does have living metal. Wave of Command. Yeah, this is the same as my will be done. It's a unit within 12. Yeah, add one to advanced charge and hit rolls. So it's got that. It's got quantum shielding here as well. So this is well protected. So not only your character here, so you can't be shot at if you're behind other targets. You're very quick. Got loads of wounds, eight wounds. And then quantum shielding on top of that as well. Each time this model fails a saving throw, roll a d6. If the result... It's say a saving throw, not, it doesn't say shooting attacks, any type of damage coming through. If the result is less than the damage inflicted, roll a dice, if the damage is less than the damage inflicted by that attack, so say it's damage 3, you roll a 2, so it's less, the damage is ignored. E.g. if this model suffers 4 damage, then you roll a 3 or less, damage is ignored. So it's not just reduced to 1, it's just entirely ignored. Quantum shielding cannot prevent damage caused by mortal wounds. This is really powerful. Hmm. It's not bad. It's not too bad at all. Uh, then usual rules for explodes, just there, and then resurrection orb, which we've covered. The only downside is you're delivering a model that's going to do three attacks, then twos to hit, and then strength seven, AP minus four, and you think, yeah, that's great, it's getting a hit, it's punching through the armor, and then it's just two damage a time. He's not going to do too much damage to stuff. He's going to kill one or two primary marines in combat. He's going to put a couple of wounds on a, on a monster or a couple of wounds on a vehicle, and that's about it. So, you know, great. It's a shame this. Yeah, this is where I think the Necrons maybe struggle is the amount of damage they can do. Oh, just because it's free attacks isn't that high an amount of attacks. So you're going to struggle. Uh, to cause trouble here against targets. Other than that, I do like everything else. So the shooting weapon's great. Uh, the gauze can's brilliant, and then the stat line here is fantastic. But just the actual, what this thing actually contains, the Overlord is is not too powerful. So it's pretty much, pretty much double the cost of an Overlord, as we'll see in just a moment. So I'd love to use that, but just the impact of it. Is it worth it? That's the question. So Overlord is next, he's power level 6. So the Overlord here is 84 points. So, a lot cheaper, but slow though, movement 5. Stat line, uh, 2 pluses here, uh, strength 5, toughness 5, 5 wounds, 3 attacks, leisure 10, 3 up save. Uh, Staff of Light already covered. All these weapons are already covered. Um, so, for example, Warside, we had an extra 11 points to that, so now you're on 95 points, so it's a, che it's a cheaper HQ. You can take the Resurrection Orb, it does have Living Metal, does have the 4 plus Invun, and it does have the My Will Be Done. So that's probably the route that I go down, sort of a cheaper one there. Out of all these HQs, say Imitech's the best, just that. If you're going to go for a, you know, going to pay out for an HQ, probably go for a good one. I would probably go for him. Then you can go for an even cheaper HQ, you can go for a Necron Lord, and still, it's not bad. Power level 5, 3 plus for weapon skill and ballistic skill, strength 5, toughness 5, at one less wound, you've got 4 wounds, still keeps 3 attacks though, and leadership 10. And his ability though drops to the Lord's Will, which is reroll wound rolls of 1. Okay. It doesn't drop, it changes to wounds. Reroll wound rolls of one for friendly infantry units within six. So that is actually pretty good. 
73 points. You can give him his uh, war scythe. Yep. And reroll wounds. Yeah, it's interesting that. Reroll wounds, that's for combat and for shooting. That's pretty powerful, actually. So it's the equivalent to a Space Marine Lieutenant, I guess. But he's well worth considering. So we're using for 84, 84 points of a war side for him. And ability for loads of units to reroll wounds. That's a pretty good option, that one. Pretty cheap. So that's him. Uh, then the Cryptech, obviously they've released a new model for him. Power level 5. He's 70 points to start off with. Movement 5, weapon skill, ballistic skill 3+. plus. Uh, strength 4, toughness 4, 4 wounds, 1 attack, so don't expect anything from him in combat. Leadership 10, 4 up save. Staff of Light, he's armed with just there, so it can cause a bit of trouble, but not going to expect too much from him. Uh, so you can take a Chronometron or a, or a Canoptic Cloak, so it's one or the other, which is a shame. Uh, so the Chronometron is 15 points and the Canoptic Cloak is 5 points. So the Chronometron uh, is infantry units within 3 inches of a friendly model of a Chronometron have 5 plus invun save against ranged weapons. It's very, very powerful, very, very helpful indeed. It really is helpful. 5 plus invun. You know, your Warriors and your other you know, Lich Guard and so on, they are going to have a lot of AP minus 2, 3 weapons coming against them, and so that ability to be protected by a 5 plus in Von Bubble, I reckon is really powerful, it's really helpful, it really is. Because you're, tr you're trying to keep, you know, trying to preserve your army as much as you can so you can keep units alive and then just reanimate, you don't want units being decimated, and that helps. If you get hit by a lot of heavy firepower, at least you're at 5 plus in Von. Uh, the Technomancer, plus one to all reanimation protocol rolls for models within, from dynasty units within three inches. That's extremely good as well. So worth taking a Cryptech. You know, 5 plus to reanimate, now it becomes 4 plus. Massive bonus, half a chance of each of those models coming back. So well worth taking that. So they all, whichever option you go for, the Cryptech, they all come with Technomancer. Whether, you, whether it's the flying one, the quicker one, or the slower one. The Chronometron, though, I think is really helpful. Canoptic Cloak, then, this is the new model here, the quicker uh, one that's uh, flying. A model equipped with a Canoptic Cloak has a move characteristic of 10 and gains the fly keyword. In addition, at the start of your turn, you can select a friendly uh, dynasty model that has living metal ability and within three inches of this model. The model regains D3 lost runes rather than one from its living metal ability. Okay. You could still roll one though. You know, one or two, it's still only going to be one wound rather than the automatic one. So, you know, for models that are gaining a wound anyway, and you move him across just to gain it, and you don't roll very well, you end up wasting your time. <sighs> so, I would see the value. I really like the new model. Problem is, I see the most more value of the chronometer. <laughs> so. Which is the old fine cast model. Oh, difficult decisions. Yeah, difficult. Hmm. Okay. Hard choice to make about that. Have to take, and then your other option is just to go for two cryptics when you start eating up your points. Because you know you see a cryptic, cryptic and you think, oh, that's very cheap. But you start at seventy points. You add on your Staff of Light, that's 10, and then you add on your Chromatron, you're up to almost 100 points for them. Problem. Okay. So, you know, t if you take two of them, all of a sudden it's 200 points used up. So it's, I'm, I'm trying to think maybe it's going to be one or the other. I hope. Tactically, the one with the Chronometron is better than the one on foot. But it depends what style you're going for. If you're going for a mobile army um, and you want some speed, then obviously take the Canoptic Cloak. So, uh, Destroyer Lord next. He's power level 7. He's 110 points is the starting cost. He's armed with a Staff of Light. Movement 10. 3 plus weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength 6, strength 5, toughness 6, 6 wounds, 4 attacks, leisure 10 to 3 up save. Model may place its Staff of Light with a Hyperface Sword, Void Blade, or War Scythe. Model may take phylactery 
or resurrection orb. Phylactery is 10 points. Model with Phylactery regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of your turn rather than one. Cool. It's got hardwired hatred, reroll hit rolls of one for this model, so that's going to be for shooting and for combat. United in hatred, you can reroll wound rolls of one in the shooting phase for this model and models from friendly dynasty destroyer and heavy destroy units of his six. Nice, that's cool. And he's got a four plus invon save as well. So yeah, he's okay. I'll probably go for a war side with him again. Yeah, and then flag training and just get him stuck into combat. And you'll do quite well at toughness six and six wounds. Three up save and a four up invon. Yeah, he's gonna be tough enough in combat and the ability to heal himself as well. Nice. So I don't think I'd send him in one-on-one in one, one on one against a lot of targets. I'd have him join in combats, maybe take a few wounds and recover himself and then go again. So he's an excellent support. And then great bonuses there available to grant to destroyers and heavy destroyers as well. Cool. So that's the Destroyer Lord. Loads of HQs here. Tons. Which is great. Right, so troops. As, uh, there's an interesting question i got here. Maybe this has already been clarified by Games Workshop. So Necron Warriors here are troops here and here. Lich Guard is elite and Death Marks are elite. So that seems straightforward enough. But if you look up troops here, and uh, under troops is Death Marks, Immortals, Lich Guard, and Necron Warriors. So which is correct? If they got the symbol wrong here, or have they got this chart wrong? Have they made Lich Guard and Immortals troops or not? I'd be surprised if they have. But I'm not sure which to go with here. Uh, and it's interesting, it's, it's, um, it's quite important to know because of my army selection I'm trying to do at the moment. So if you know that's been clarified, leave that in the comments section. Are these troops or are they elites? They're elites here, but they're troops listed at the back. But anyway, Necron, your standard Necron Warriors, which is actually an iconic unit, one of my favourites. I love seeing droves of them. Um, first sort of saw that tactic with Fritz 40k on YouTube. Uh, his Necron army uh, had that with the waves of Necron Warriors all spread out. It looked really cool. So that was a big inspiration. Necron Warriors then. So your standard Necron Warriors, 12 points. So unit of 10 is 120 points. It's pretty cheap. Here. and so if you're looking to bulk your army out, I would recommend the Necron Warriors. Uh, you have to take 10, you can take another 10, so you can go up to units of 20. Uh, each model is armed with a Gauze Flayer. If you do go for larger units, what helps these out more than most of the factions is their high leadership. They are leadership 10, which will help absorb models that flee uh, quite well. Yeah, you'd have to lose a good few before morale becomes too much of an issue. So the Gauze Flayer is a really good weapon. It's range 24, rapid fire 1, so you get an extra shot within range 12, strength 4, and this is the crucial bit, AP minus 1. So the standard infantry weapon here is AP minus 1. I think that makes them, that's really cool. So you can knock a Space Marine down to a 4 up save, or Space Marines in cover, 2 up save, no, they'll get a 3 up save after that minus 1. So that is helpful. And then reanimation protocols as well. So the ability to come back to life again. So a larger, a larger unit, I'm thinking, taking multiple casualties and then just rebuild them again each turn. Instead of small units being picked off and destroyed, just large units absorb the damage. And yes, maybe some flee, but still that's all absorbed into the large number. So units of 15, 20. Just this big legion of them. Nice big, moving around a nice big square block. <laughs> it look quite good into reanimation, because it just it's such a disheartening thing. Uh, your opponents used all his firepower up, he's knocked loads of these models down, and then they all start coming back again, turn after turn. Very cool. So that's the kind of theme I'm thinking. Um, but then I don't want a pure infantry army, <sighs> just a bit, maybe a bit slow and not quite balanced enough, but it was a nice aspect to have. Immortal sense, you can up, you can push them up to go up to another level. It's uh, power level 6, by the way, for 10 of them. Power level 4 for 5 of these uh, Immortals. 
So the mortals are eight points each, but then you have to add in the gauze blaster, which is nine points. So 17 points each, so unit 10 is 170 points. So the improvement then is the armor save. It goes from four plus to three plus, and then obviously you're paying out for a, a better weapon. Uh, the gauze blaster is extra strength, same range, rapid fire one, strength five, so you'll freeze to win things like marines. Uh, and what helps with strength five is you're trying to win something that's toughness eight, like even Russ. You're gonna need fives with this instead of sixes. AP minus two as well, the AP improves on that. So instead of that, you can go for Tesla carbines. Um, nine points. So there's no points difference. There's no cheaper version. Tesla carbines assault two. So you're at longer range, you're going to be chucking out more shots. Strength five. There's no minus on the AP at all. And then the damage is one. But if for every hit roll of a six you get with this weapon, uh, it causes three hits instead of one. And then remember the Necron Overlord here with his My Will Be Done. Plus one to the hit rolls. That means on five pluses. Uh, with these guys, you would be scoring uh, the extra free hits, which is pretty good. So that's something to bear in mind. To plus the opponent loads of hits, potentially. Uh, reanimation protocols available for them as well. So next is Lich Guard. At the moment I have five Lich Guard with the Hyperface Swords and Dispersion Shields. Uh, they've struggled in all the games we've played really. They just sort of wander around, they're slow. It's hard to get them to where they need to be, so I'm not sure, but I love the models, they're great. So not sure what to do with these. Um, so Lich Guard, they're, they're power level 8. They're under troops here. Uh, 19 points each for these. Uh, then you've got to add on the standard armor, is the War Sire, which is 11 points, that's 30 points each. Uh, you have to take 5 and you can take an additional 5. Movement 5, weapon skill, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength 5, toughness 5, 2 wounds, 2 attacks, leisure 10 to 3 up safe. I mean, they are tough enough. Pretty good. Um, so, these could cause trouble for units. I mean, a unit of 5 of them, 10 attacks with war scythes, you, know, you get 7 hits, and then you're going to be on strength 7 with the plus 2 strength, 8 minus 4 and 2 damage. Yeah, there's a good chance for them to destroy targets pretty good. So they're pretty nasty with war scythes. Or you can go for the hyperface swords and cut stuff down. So you may replace the war scythes with hyperface swords and dispersion shields. So maybe you're on 19 points. Uh, the dispersion shield is another 12 points. And then the hyperface sword is another 3 points on top of that as well. So an extra 15 points to add on. Uh, to that, so 34 points each for them. Unit of 10 is 340 points. Expensive. If you take the dispersion shield, you do get the 4 plus invun save. And then uh, each roll, uh, Guardian Protocols, roll d d6 each time a friendly character loses a wound whilst it infringes this unit. I'm just reading it here because it says you can, you don't have to. On a 2 plus, a model from this unit can intercept that hit, not must, so it's optional. Uh, the character does not lose a wound, but this unit suffers a mortal wound, so you can absorb damage coming in against the character. Nice. Um, yeah, Lich Guard. So I, I like the two options. I see the damage potential the War Scythe can cause is about the best melee option for the Necron Infantry. Uh, but then you've got the protection ability there granted by the dispersion shields. It's hard. It's a hard choice to make. The war sides are cheaper. The great thing about these is the reanimation protocols. They can actually come back. So yes, expensive models, but it's well worth trying to get the right unit size because they can just come back. This is a unit of 10. The Viva type is, is very appealing. You go too small and it becomes achievable for your opponent to wipe them out with firepower. Um, you know, if you've got a unit of 10 and you lose all of them apart from one, you can have nine re reanimation protocols to make to get them to come back again. You know, and that's an exceptionally powerful rule on the more expensive and powerful units. But which to go for? Such a hard choice. Or both, but your army's gonna start getting expensive. So, 
The next Elite, yeah, Power Level 5 is Def Mark. So I've loved the models, but never really seen them, them being too effective. Uh, Def Marks, they're 19 points each, they're expensive enough. And they're armed with a Synaptic Disintegrator, which is zero. So you just pay 90, so unit 10 is 190 points. Um, so, same, the usual stat line for Necron Immortals, it's the same, it's all the same here. Just one attack, one wound. Three plus, we haven't seen a ballistic skill yet, three up save. Now, Yes, you can take an additional five, so you can go up to units of ten. The disintegrated in range 24, rapid fire one. This weapon may target a character even if it's not the closest enemy unit. Each tire wound roll of a six plus for this weapon, the target suffers a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. It's okay, but I don't see them being that great. Hunters from hyperspace. During deployment, you can set up this unit in the hyperspace oubliette instead of placing it on the battlefield. At the end of your movement phases, any of your movement phases, the death marks can slip back into reality. Set them up anywhere on the battlefield that is, within, that is more than nine inches away from enemy models. So they can do the ambush, rapid fire ambush. So unit 10 of them, 20 shots. If they're in 12 of this unit or character you're going after. So you're going to cause a, a mortal wound or two, plus the regular wounds. Uh, Ethereal interception. Whilst an enemy unit is set up, other than during deployment or when disembarking, you can immediately set up a unit of death marks that was set up in hyperspace oubliette on the battlefield anywhere more than nine inches away from any enemy models within 12 of the enemy units that's just been set up you can make a shooting attack with this unit as if it were your shooting phase but this attack must target the enemy unit that was just set up so like a nice ambush available from them but is the firepower that deadly oh damn I just don't see it being that scary no, I, w I wouldn't rate them, sad to say. I think they're expensive what they can do. Yeah. I'd rather take a unit of 15 Necron Warriors, I reckon, than 10 of these. Yeah, it's difficult. They're nice models, but I don't see the benefit of them, really. Um, it's them flayed ones. They're, they're in the Elite section here. Uh, they're 17 points each, so these are pretty expensive as well. Uh, they're power level 4. Uh, 5 flayed ones, you can take 5 of them, or 10, or 15, so you have a huge unit of these. And they've got flayer claws, which I presume is 0, yep. It's movement 5, they're still slow enough. Weapon skill 3+, plus, ballistic skill 6+, plus, strength 4, toughness 4, 1 wound, 3 attacks, leadership 10, the 4 up save. They do have reanimation protocols. Flayer Claws is strength user, no minus on the AP, one damage, and you can reroll wounds. Flesh Hunger, if any flayed ones slay any models in the unit, the unit subtracts one from its leadership, which is pretty poor. And then Haunting Horrors, during deployment you can set up this unit in a, a charnel pocket dimension. Instead of placing it on the battlefield, at the end of any movement phases, the flayed ones can crawl out into reality, set them up uh, more than nine inches away from enemy models. Yet I don't see them being very powerful either. Really, you get 10, be 30 attacks, but just there's no punch to their ability. Good for mashing through hordes, but I uh, don't know. Just don't see them being that powerful. I have a headache for Necrons, really. I, I think they've s suffered since 7th. I just they don't seem to be too high impact. The, the, a bit, the ability to their survivability is still there for sure. Their durability is still there, definitely. That's strong and fine. But the, the damage output of their weapons, yeah, for some of the units, death marks, laid ones, not that great. Um, the best we've seen, the best we've seen so far would be. The firepower of the Immortals is pretty good. Uh, Necron Warriors and Necron Immortals getting in rapid fire range, that 12 inch range, then you can start saturating the opponent with lots of hits. So it means getting your army in quite close to deal out that kind of damage, which means you need to be able to stand up for yourself in combat. And then you're looking at things like Lich Guard uh, here, and the, the best option for them is probably the, probably the war side. 
Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's not too much to worry about. Maybe the ability of Necrons is to just to consistently chuck out some damage and then to uh, receive damage and absorb it and reanimate and just keep grinding away. Sort of an army that grinds you down. Not necessarily wiping out one unit after the next and display of dazzling firepower, but rather just grinding units down, chipping off the wounds, and then in return surviving uh, the impact that comes back. So the next one is the Triarch Praetorians. I, I like the look of these. I really do like them. Um, so these are under elites. They're 22 points each. It doesn't sound too good. <laughs> They're quite expensive. Uh, they're armed with a rod, a rod of covenant. So you got to pay ten points for that. So you're looking at thirty-two points for these, with the rod of covenant. So comparable price to, to the lich guard with these guys, um, but the te their uh, stat line is pretty much the same. So it is the same, other than movement, doubling your movement, got to movement ten. So all of a sudden you've got a necron here that's pretty quick. So that's a, a major advantage for these. Uh, five triarch Praetorians. You can take another five of them. And the Rod of Covenant then, this is sort of the standard loadout for these. You can shoot with it, range 12, Assault 1, Strength 5, minus 3. So, it's nasty enough. And then in combat, it's Strength for the user, which is Strength 5. And then, minus 3 on that, and 1 damage. It's not bad. No, I'd say it's not, not a bad weapon. These guys can fly, so remember they can pull out a combat and shoot. So the entire unit may replace their Rods of Covenant with Void Blades and Particle Casters. So, if you go for the Void Blade, it's 6 points. And then the Particle Caster is 4 points, so it's 10. So, it's the same. It's a straight swap, there's no difference in points. You still get Shooting Ability, you get Pistol 1, Range 12, Strength 6, actually a higher strength, but no minus on the AP and 1 damage. And then in, in combat is strength of the user, which is strength five, minus three and one damage. It's exactly the same, it lost anything there, but then you get an extra attack with this weapon. So there are two attacks become three attacks. So unit 10 gets 30 attacks. Now as unit 10 with 30 attacks, you have your um, overlord nearby. Mine will be done. Let's just have a look. Mine will be done. The unit within six inches. Mm, they're going to be quite nearby to grant that. Yeah, interesting. So, so I got, I'm just imagining these jumping off way ahead of the army, but you'd have to keep them nearby to get your My Will Be Done. Now, let's just check something else here. Sorry, here. Yeah, uh, the beginning of your turn. Aha, right, so you grant it before you jump and move. So, yes, you could start within six. Jump off 10, and you still get your plus one to hit. So all of a sudden you've got 30 attacks, then twos to hit in combat. Yeah. Not bad, but it's an expensive unit, 320 odd points. For all of that, for 10 of them. For whichever combination you decide to go for. I would, be, oh dear. And again, don't know which one to go for. <laughs> it's hard, both of those seem good. I do like these, and what's great about these is reanimation protocols, they get to come back again. Uh, and then, something else here. <clears throat> the issue of morale, but look at this, per a purpose unshakable, this unit automatically passes morale tests, so there's no worry about models uh, fleeing. So, for out of all these units, if you're gonna max out, units can be them. Make them 10 strong, and not worry about any morale, and then just reanimate all the time. Good job. So, I like those. So, then you've got the Triarch Stalker, it's that spider walker thing. I don't have one of these. Uh, it's it's uh, power level 8. This is under, still under elites here actually. It's 117 points to start off with. It's on a damage chart here. Uh, strength 7, toughness 6, 10 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 10, and a 3 up save. Uh, then you on um, 10 inch moves that fast enough weapon skill 3 plus ballistic skill 3 plus yeah, these are quick then you drop down uh, 3 to 5 wounds remaining 8 inch move 4 up uh, there 4 up for weapon skill and ballistic skill 
then to five up for weapon skill and ballistic skill, six inch move for one to two wounds remaining. Uh, so it's armed with a heat ray and massive forelimbs, massive forelimbs of free of charge, and then the heat ray is ouch, 54 points. So you can have 170 odd points to equip this thing uh, in total. So expensive enough here. Uh, but it's as tough as an average vehicle, as a Rhino. Yeah, no, tough than six, so not quite as tough. So uh, the heat ray then, you can choose two options. Uh, dispersed, it's like a heavy, a super heavy flame really. Range eight, heavy 2d6, uh, it's auto hit, so you're gonna get between two and 12 hits with that. Pretty good. Uh, strength, five, AP minus one and one damage. That's the good bit. Uh, then focused, range 24, heavy two, so you get two shots. Strength 8 minus 4 and D6. And if you're in half range, which is 12, you're going to get 2 D6. Choose the best uh, for that result. The only downside is it's heavy and there's no bonuses here for. Uh, there's no help with heavy weapons. So you're going to be on fours to hit. And as soon as you start taking damage, say you've um, you drop the next bracket, 4 plus to hit, that becomes 5 plus to hit if you've. Uh, moving. So worried about the accuracy of that thing and you're paying enough points for it. Uh, the model may replace its heat ray with a particle shredder or a twin gauze, heavy gauze cannon. So the twin heavy gauze cannon is 54 so it's the same. Uh, for that you obviously don't get the dispersed option. But it's range 36, it's a better range, it's quite rare range 36 for Necrons, all their stuff's range 24, heavy 2, uh, strength still going to be the same problem though, strength 9, AP minus 4 and D6 damage, so it's that, but still just that minus on the move, and it probably is going to be moving a fair bit, uh, then you can go for a particle shredder which is heavy 6, strength 7, minus 1 and D3 damage, again same problem, range 24, particle shredders will be cheaper, it's 41 points, yeah. The weapon is not bad, but uh, it's okay. It depends how you use your Necrons. If you just remember to remain stationary just to get you uh, the best ballistic skill that you can. Uh, you can fight here. Weapon skill is 3+, plus, and it drops down with the damage brackets. And when you fight, you get 3 attacks and increase strength of the user, which is strength 7, minus 1 D3 damage. So it can fight, not too bad in combat. Uh, living metal for that as well, so it can heal a wound. Uh, each turn and then quantum shielding as well as so is well protected by heavy firepower coming in and then the targeting relay you can reroll hit rolls of one for any friendly necrons to make a shooting attack against a unit that's already been attacked by triarch stalkers by any triarch stalkers in this phase so not too bad and then explodes uh, usual results just there so triarch stalkers okay it does help the Necrons with uh, heavy firepower. Right, Catan. Next, the Catan uh, Shard of the Deceiver is next. It's power level 12. Of the Deceiver, it's 225 points. That includes all your war gear, so that's the total price that you'll pay. Movement 8, weapon skill and ballistic skill 2 plus, strength 7, toughness 7, 8 wounds. This is a great character. Yeah, you can hide him. Pretty good, four attacks. Leadership, ten, a four up save. So he's armed with Star God Fists, which is strength of the user, it'll be strength seven, AP minus four, and three damage. So it's pretty nasty. And then the Necrodermis, the Catan Shard of the Deceiver is a four plus invon save. These are pretty good here. Dredge, your opponent must add one to morale tests. Any enemy units within 12 of the Shard of the Deceiver. Grand Illusion, at the beginning of the first battle round, before the first turn begins, you can remove the Catan Shard uh, and or up to D3 other friendly Necron units from the battlefield, then send them up again more than 12 inches from enemy models. If you do so, these units cannot charge on your first turn. Wow. Whoa. Quite an ambush available from him. So maybe not for close combat, but if you want an ambush of firepower, that's pretty good. It's quite a manoeuvre you can pull with one of these. Uh, powers of the Catan. The Catan Shard of the Deceiver 
knows two powers of Catan, it can use one of its powers at the end of each of its movement phases. That's page 113, we'll check them out in just a moment. It's pretty, it's pretty good this. This is elites we're on here. Reality unravels. If the Catan Shard of the Deceiver is ever reduced to zero wounds, roll a d6 before removing it from the battlefield and a 4+, plus, its Necrodermis tears a hole in reality, and each unit within 3 inches suffers d3 mortal wounds, it's like an explodes result. And his slave star god, the model can never have a warlord trait. So we'll check out these powers now. Page 113. So already, it's pretty good. It's decent enough in combat. And uh, a brilliant maneuver you can use there with the Grand Illusion. It really is good. It's tough enough, it can fight pretty good. Plenty of wounds, and he's a character, so it's, uh, it's a good option that for the Necrons. So, powers the Catan then. Before the battle, generate powers the Catan for each Catan shard using the table below. Uh, roll d6 to generate their powers randomly, re rolling any duplicate results. Before the battle, you can instead choose the powers. Alright, so it's okay, so you can choose if you want to. And let's just see what it says here. But if you do this, you cannot choose a power for a second time till all six have been chosen once each. Okay. So, Antimatter Meteor is the one. Roll D6 on a 2 plus, the closest visible enemy unit within 24 suffers D3 mortal wounds. On a 6, it suffers D6 mortal wounds. It's like psychic powers then, really. The Katan Shard uses this power. In it. If the Katan Shard using this power is a Tesseract Vault, the unit suffers D6 mortal wounds. On the order of 5 plus instead. Times arrow. Pick a visible enemy unit within 18 of the Katan Shard and roll d6, adding 1 to the result of the Katan Shard using the power as a Tesseract Vault. If the result exceeds the highest wounds characteristic in the unit, one model from that unit chosen by the controlling player is slain. An unmodified roll of 1 will always fail. Okay, that's alright. Sky Falling Stars. Pick up three different enemy units. Pick up two. Three, not pick up. <laughs> pick up to three different enemy units that are within 18 inches of the Catan Shard. Or a d6 for each. Subtract to one from the result. The Catan Shard using this power is a Tesseract Vault. If the result is less than the number of models in the unit, the unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. And one, one modified roll of six will always fail. Sim it's kind of similar kind of powers really. Cosmic Fire, or d6 for each enemy unit of nine in the Catan Shard. Add one to the roll of if the Catan Shard using this power is in Tesseract Vault, and 4 plus unit being rolled for suffers D3 mortal wounds. That's a good one. Potential cause real trouble there. Seismic Assault is next. Pick a visible enemy unit within 24 of the Catan Shard. Roll a D6 for each model in that unit. Uh, add 1 if it's in Tesseract Vault. For each 6, the unit suffers a mortal wound. Okay. Each model. Transdimensional Thunderbolt. It's all mortal wounds here. Pick a visible enemy unit within 24 of a Catan Shard and roll a d6. You can only pick a character if it has 10 or more wounds and there is the closest enemy model. Add one to the result of the Catan Shard using the power as a Tesseract Vault and 4 plus the chosen unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Then roll a d6 for every other enemy unit within 3 inches and a 4 plus unit being rolled 4 suffers a mortal wound. So they're all similar. Really, but it's just a bonus powers there available. Uh, mortal wounds are deadly, just bypasses everything. So, not bad. No, the Shard of the Deceiver's pretty good. Right, next is the Shard of the Nightbringer. Same stat line. Yes. Same power level, power level at 12 for him. It's 210 points, so it's cheaper this one. So he's under the gaze of death, range 12, assault d6, strength, uh, it's always 2's to wind, unless it's a vehicle, in which case it's 6's, AP minus 4 and d3 damage. And he's got uh, Scythe of the Nightbringer, melee weapon, strength, uh, it's always wounds on a 2+, plus, unless it's a vehicle, in which case it's strength 7, AP minus 4 and d6 damage, ouch. Whoa, Scythe's horrendous. Uh, it's 4 plus Invon, Necrodermis, Power of Catan, 
can use two powers. It can use one of its powers at the end of each movement phase. Uh, reality unravels. If the Katana Shard of the Nightbringers have reduced to zero, win right, okay, it's fine. And you can never take a wall of trait. Okay. So basically, it, better in combat with that deadly scythe. D6 damage and AP minus four. Two's to win. Yeah, not bad at all. So nice enough. If Necrons want decent close combat ability, they can with these. And sort of psychic equivalent stuff going on there as well with them. Never really considered them, but they're definitely an option to take, for sure. And the characters, I think they're more powerful now for 8th edition. Difficult to uh, target. So, Canoptic Wraiths is next. A big, big fan of these in uh, previous editions. They were utterly deadly. Uh, rock solid, hard to kill with that 3 plus invon save. And then they used to mash through vehicles. Pretty good. Um, not so much anymore. In the, in the old edition, 7th edition, it was uh, these fought at strength 6, which they are here. And then you struck uh, the rear armor of the vehicle, which is 10. So you usually need 4 or more with your wounds to try and cause some kind of trouble. You're only trying, usually trying to get through uh, 3 hull points on a vehicle. So it's quite easy to, to cut through vehicles. Pretty good. In fact, you know, if I took a unit of 6 of these, I'd usually multi-charge them against vehicles and, and cause trouble. But now... The damage isn't as much, so are, are these wraiths as good? We're on fast here, but this is the first of the fast attack. So 55 points a time. They're armed with the Vicious Claws, which is 0 points. So 55 points each for these. At movement 12, so still nice and quick. Weapon skill, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength 6, toughness 5, 3 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 10, 4 up save. Um, so, the vicious claws then, strength the user, which is strength 6, AP minus 2, and then uh, 2 damage at a time. Now, like vehicles, for example, now they'll be on 5s to wound. This is the problem. So, they're not as good against vehicles. Uh, they'd be a real bane for any sort of Primaris Marine type models. You know, freeze to wound, AP minus two, and any damage is double damage. So they're nasty enough. Uh, they um, have a three plus invun save, and they can move across models and terrains if it were not there. Models in this unit can shoot and charge even if they fell back, so flexible enough. Now the ballistic skills three plus, let's see if it's worth equipping them with any shooting here. So any model may take a particle caster, transdimensional beamer, or whip coils. So whip coils is basically the same as vicious claws, except you always you get to fight first. No, uh, it's if you're slain, you leave the model where it is, and then you still get to fight. If that, which is handy enough to see how much that costs. Nine points. Whoa! So you go from zero to nine points just to have that ability. Hmm, that's expensive enough. Uh, then particle casters then, pistol 1, range 12, strength 6, AP 0 and 1 damage. Bit of pistol fire, if you want that. Just 4 points, it's maybe worth it. Bit of firepower. And then the trans dimensional beamer. It's 14 points a time. It's heavy D3, strength 4, minus 3. Each time I roll a wound of a 6 for this weapon, it's a mortal wound, in addition to any other damage. Okay, so yeah, I'd maybe just have them, because they're expensive enough in points, maybe just have them as they come. So just flat 55 points. Yeah. Tough enough. But they're not as. I don't think they cause as much trouble. They're as tough as they used to be, just as quick. Not as scary as they were in combat. I would say they're better now against infantry, it would be the better option. Anything like heavy armoured, like Space Marines, Terminators, uh, those Primaris Marines, models with two wounds especially, would uh, be pretty efficient against them. But vehicles, they'll cause some trouble. It would be handy for silencing vehicles, you charge them in 
uh, maybe not kill the vehicle, but you charge the vehicle and then stop stopping it from firing next turn. And durable enough to gradually get up the board. Scarabs next. Always like these things as well. So uh, movement 10. Weapon skill 4 plus. There's no ballistic skill for these. Strength 3, toughness 3. 3 wounds. 4 attacks. Leadership 10 to 6 up save. So you have to take 3 of them. Power level 2. Uh, power level 9 for them by the way. Uh, power level 2. You have to take 3. You can take 3 more or 6 more. And they're armed with feeder mandibles. Is 0. And scarabs. 13 points a base, please. So the mandibles then. Strength use minus 0 and 1 damage. If the target's toughness is higher than the attack strength, this weapon always wounds the target on a 5 plus. So strange rules for these. I have the fly keyword, it's interesting. And swarm. Yeah. I've tried these out a number of times, sort of mixed results. They're okay for tying units down, but they don't they get shot to bits. They usually get shot to pieces. This is usually what happens. So I've struggled with them. And then by the time they reach target, say a vehicle, you've only got like two or three bases left. They maybe cause a wound or two, but then they're dealt with. So I don't rate them that highly. Not very tough at all. You know, like the save, there's just nothing to it. Six up save. So they're usually shot to bits. Okay. So, so I think the old rules used to be able to advance and charge them. They were scary, you could catch people out very quickly with them. But I think they used to be 12 inch range. But now they're the 10 inches. They're not as quick as they were and they just usually get shot to bits. So not so sure about the scarabs. Tomb Blades next. Another unit I think has taken a hit as well. In 7th edition I used to arm them with the particle uh, beamers I think and it used to be the old blast marker strength 6 you used to have like a squad of 6 of these and you just hit the opponent with loads of these uh, blast markers especially on densely packed infantry and you get like 6 hits per marker and you times that but you suddenly you just get tons of hits and then I used to give them the upgrades where you uh, shot signal cover and they were AP, it was AP 5 uh, yeah it was AP 5 where they could bypass 5 plus armour. Remember I debuted these, uh, 6 of them, and I fired at a Commissar of 50 conscripts and wiped them out in one <laughs> round of shooting. Those those days are gone here as we'll see. Uh, power level 5, you have to take 3 of them, you can take 3 more or 6 more, so you go up to units of 9 with two blades. They're 14 points each. Uh, each one is equipped to two gauze blasters. So your gauze blasters are nine times that by two, so 18 plus 14. They're very expensive. They're really expensive. It's over 30 points for these. Hmm. Before any upgrades as well. So you move 14, they are nice and quick. Weapon skill, ballistic skill three plus, strength four, toughness five, two wounds. One attack, leadership 10 to 4 up save. So it's the speed and the firepower. The two Gauze Blaster. So Gauze Blaster is range 24, strength, uh, rapid fire 1, strength 5, minus 2 and 1 damage. So at range 24, with the two of them, you get two shots or four shots in rapid fire range. Particle Beamer is uh, another option you can take. Uh, it's now Assault 3, strength 6, AP 0 and 1 damage. Not much to it at all. Or you can go for Tesla Carbines. Assault 2, so remember that's going to become Assault 4. Particle Beam is actually Assault. No, it's not. You may replace the two Gauze Blasters with two Tesla Carbines or a Particle Beamer. Okay. So if you just go for a Particle Beamer, it's 10 points. Which is a cheaper option, but dreadful firepower. Horrific. And Tesla Carbine, uh, two of them, so you're going to be Assault 4. Strength 5, AP 0, 1 damage. Any sixes you get is three hits instead of one. But no minus on the AP, it's quite tame weaponry. Uh, 
and a Tesla carbine. It's 9 plus 9, so another 18 points. So you may take shield veins, anyone may take a nebula scope or a shadow loom. Shadow loom is 5, nebula scope is 2. Uh, yep, shield veins is 3. It's not too expensive those upgrades. Uh, they're reanimation protocols, so they do get to come back again. Evasion and grams, your opponent must subtract one from hit rolls that target this unit in the shooting phase. That's pretty good. Minus one to hit. Interesting. Uh, shield veins model has a save characteristic of three plus. You get your three plus save. That's probably worth taking. Shadow loom. You can go for a five plus invun save. Or nebula scope. Models do not receive the bonus of their save for being in cover. Made by model with a nebula scope. Okay. It's no, it's no benefit for cover. It's all t it's tamed. It's all tamed down a bit. And they're expensive in points. Yeah, shame that, but I don't think they're as effective. The firepower used to be deadly, but not anymore. So next option is the uh, destroyers here. The unit I've despised for a long time. But we'll give them a chance here. Uh, 30 points each to start off with. So the power level three. Uh, their movement 10, which is quick enough. Weapon skill, ballistic skill 3 plus. Strength 4, toughness 5, 3 wounds, 2 attacks, leadership 10, and 3 up saves. A good stat line. So you can take just one of them. Interesting if you're trying to fill out maybe a brigade, it's probably very hard um, for Necrons. Uh, you can include up to 5 additional destroyers. If unit contains at least 3, a heavy destroyer can take the place of a destroyer. Each model is armed with a Gauls cannon. So 30 plus uh, Gauls Cannon 20. So you look at 50 points each for these. Oh, again, expensive. Yep. But they're, they're, I think they're okay. You've got three wounds on these, toughness five. Uh, so the, the Heavy Destroyer. Heavy Gauls Cannon is 27. And the Heavy Destroyer is 30. It's the same. So it's just the weapons you pay an extra for. 27 as opposed to 20. So for the extra 7 points, uh, you're getting. Yeah, yeah this is, these aren't bad actually. Uh, heavy 1. Range 36. Strength 9 minus 4 and d6 damage. It's nasty. And you get. Reanimation protocols of these. That is excellent. Hardwired hatred. You can reroll hit rolls of one. Nice. That's shooting and close combat. So this is very reliable gun platforms, these things. And then repulsor platform. This unit can move and fire heavy weapons without suffering the penalty to its hit, hit rolls. That's excellent. So, fast, durable, and some excellent firepower available from these. Pretty much go. If units are three, you can bury a heavy gauze cannon there. You're looking about 100, well, it could be 157 points. The gauze cannon's really good. It's heavy three. But remember, there's no minus here for these things. Strength six, minus three, and D3 damage. So yes, you may be on five pluses to win vehicles, but if you get those five pluses, it's going to knock the armor save down by three. And uh, D3 damage, each one that gets through. So they'll cause trouble for vehicles. Yeah, because you're shooting, you can freeze to hit reordering ones. Pretty good. Yeah, no, I'd rate them. The destroyers. Not bad. Yeah, so they make up for the lack of maneuverability and speed for a lot of the Necron units. And yet, uh, their firepower's some of the best we've seen so far. So then, uh, heavy destroyers, we've seen these already. This is heavy support, so a pure uh, heavy destroyer unit. Uh, we've seen, we know the stat line for them already. We know the weapon. Uh, they're 30 points each. 27 for heavy gauze cannon. Hard wide hatred. No movement penalties and reanimation protocols for them. So the composition is you have to take one, and then you can take one more or two more for them. Yeah. Next one. Uh, on heavy heavy support now. Uh, power level three for him. Uh, power level three here. Power level 5 for the Tomb Blades. 
Canoptic spiders, they're power level four. Again, I was a big fan of these. I used to like using them for generating. This has all been changed as well. I used to like generating extra scarab bases, but now your reserves, uh, your reinforcements, you have to calculate as part of your list. So there's no getting units for free anymore. Which is, I do miss that. Um, so spiders, don't, not the bonus they used to have. This is why I'm struggling with the Necron <laughs> list, because all my old units uh, aren't that great really anymore. So it's sort of thrown the whole philosophy of how to do the army in the air. Uh, Canoptic spiders, in, this is, they aren't too bad though. Power level 4. Uh, so they're 65 points each. They come with the automaton claws. I think a free charge, yeah, so it's just flat 65. For that you get movement 6, weapon skill and ballistic skill 4 plus strength, 6 toughness 6, 4 wounds, 4 attacks, they should tend to free up safe. They're not bad. Um, they are, uh, the claws then is strength user, which is strength 6, AP minus 2 and D3 damage, and then you can take a fabricator claw array, check out the rules for that in just a moment. It's five points to take that. At uh, the end of your movement phase, a model equipped with a fabricator claw array can repair a single dynasty vehicle model within an inch. The unit regains D3 wounds lost earlier in the battle. And the model can only be repaired once per turn. Hmm. So you just want to go on repair duty. It's just five points to do that. I think, I think that'd be worth it if you're taking vehicles. Uh, you can take a gloom prison. This is five points for blocking your psychic powers you can deny one psychic power on each enemy psychic base in the same manner as a psycho and then uh, scarab hive is in built you just get that as normal the model may take two particle beamers so hit like six shots and that is cost 10 and 10 20 points extra for that so scarab hive at the beginning of your turn you can roll d6 for each Canoptic Scarabs unit in your army that is below its starting number of models and within six inches of any friendly uh, Canoptic Spiders. On a one, one of those Canoptic Spiders units within six uh, of the unit being rolled for suffers a mortal wound. On two plus, one of those Canoptic Spiders units within six of the unit being rolled for unleashes reinforcements. Return a Canoptic Spider Swarm to the depleted unit in the unit coherency in one and one inch many models. If you cannot do this because there is no room to place the model, do not set it up. So, yeah, no, I, th I think, really, it's just return, it says here, you don't generate new models anymore, um, it's return a Canoptic Scarab Swarm to the depleted unit. So there's no creation, no, it's no creating out of fresh air anymore. So actually, this is just for repairing and bring it back bases that have already been destroyed. So that's the way it works for these. Okay. So you can't grow bigger units. Take a minimum loadout of scarabs, as well I used to do for free bases, and then just let a few turns pass and just grow them, and then send them off. It's only for repairing, re uh, replacing damage, or re replacing lost models. So. Yes, they're okay. Hmm. Next is the monolith. I've, I've taken this in the previous list in 8th edition. People have been very skeptical of it. <laughs> I just, I think it's good. I, I still like the monolith. I really do think it's great. Um, so the monolith is 381 points. It's a deadly amount of points. Uh, so Gore's Flux Arcs is zero. And then the particle whip is zero, so it's a flat 381 points. So it is a fair amount of points, but it can take a beating, it really can. Power level 19. So it is a damage chart, uh, it has 20 wounds, and you drop down to 10 wounds or less, uh, and then 5 wounds or less, so half and then quarter for your damage brackets. Uh, at full strength, you're on movement 6. Ballistic skill 3 plus and portal of exile is a 4 plus. And then you drop down to BS, uh, movement down to 6, 
3.54, BS down to 3.45, and then Port of XR 4.56. Uh, weapon skill 3, uh, 6 plus. Strength 8, toughness 8. That's where it takes the damage pretty good. Toughness 8. Um, that really helps out. And then uh, 20 wounds, that's a lot of wounds. 3 attacks, lose your 10 to 3 up, so. So, I don't these aren't too bad. There's plenty of options here. You are on a 3 plus here for shooting. Not 4 plus, being clarified. Um, 24 inch range of the particle whip, first of all. Heavy 6, you guarantee 6 shots a time. Uh, strength 8, AP minus 2, and D3 damage. You are going to chip away wounds on vehicles pretty effectively. And, and bring down heavy infantry pretty good. Uh, then the flux arc, heavy 3. Remember, there's 4 of these. And then there's no rotating the vehicle and testing angles anymore. So you're just going to get all t 12 shots a time here. At strength 5, minus 2 and 1 damage. I think the firepower is pretty good. It's living metal, so you're going to repair a wound. Death descending. During deployment, you can set up this model in the upper atmosphere instead of placing it on the battlefield. At the end of your movement phases, end of any of your movement phases, the monolith can plummet to the battlefield. Set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than 12 inches from enemy models. The only caution I've had with this is you've got to be more than 12, not 9. And believe me, when you, enemy units start to spread around, it, you struggle to get an ambush. Or la try and land between something or behind enemy lines. It really is hard. And if your opponent knows that you're coming, um, it's going to spread out. So expect to descend it down near where your battle line is. Um, and I, it's, I reckon it's a wise option because... If you're set up and you don't go first, and your opponent just gets to fire all his laser cannons, that and your monoliths are wrecked. So you could play it where you've got your infantry set out and have these hidden away turn one, so that if you go first, you bring them down. If your opponent goes first, they're hidden away and they can't be shot at, and then you bring them down. So that's, that is tactically that's helpful. Portal of Exile. When an enemy unit other than a monster or vehicle finishes a charge move within an inch of this model, uh, its portal of exile may activate roll d6 and compare it to the value, so 4 plus, 5 plus, or 6. And if the roll is successful, the charging unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Scary. Hovering. Distances are measured to and from the model's hull, even though it has a base. Floating fortress. You can move and fire heavy weapons without suffering the penalty to your hit rolls. That's excellent. So you're just going to be on freeze to hit. It's really, really good. So, uh, Eternity Gate, when you set up this model, at the same time you can also set up any number of friendly infantry units in their tomb world, rather than setting them up on the battlefield. Before this model moves in the movement phase, a single friendly dynasty unit that was set up on the tomb world can be transported onto the battlefield by the monolith. Set up that unit so it's wholly within three inches of this model. So anywhere, not, not where the gate is, just anywhere around. So it's quite tactically quite flexible, and um, more than an inch away from enemy models. If all Dynasty Knight size of monoliths from your army are destroyed, any friendly Dynasty units still in their tomb world are considered to be slain. So that's the danger, is you could lose them. But there's some stratagems that can help you out with that. So this is the great, some great fixes that uh, GW have done with the stratagems. Um, and then uh, rules for explodes just there. Six inches is D6 mortal wounds. So tactically, uh, this is pretty good. So you've got your monolith here. You've moved him out. Uh, opponent's units are here, monolith's there, you call in your reinforcements, deploy them in three, and then... Uh, I can't see what restrictions there are. Obviously you can't move after that because it's at the... Is it the end of the start? Yeah, before this model moves in your movement phase. Ah, right, so it happens at the start. A single friendly it sets up on the battlefield, yeah. So is it like disembarkation? I, I think it is, in which case you deploy them three and you're free to move off, advance, fire, charge and so on. I believe so, in which case uh, tactically that's pretty pretty good. You can pull out some uh, pretty good ambushes there. Things like Necron Immortals, you just land there and let rip with some firepower or bring in some Lich Guard or something and then try and do a close combat ambush. So tactically pretty good. And they can take a beating, 20 wounds to absorb with these things. And uh, they're a pretty good fire magnet for distracting the opponent away from your other stuff. It usually takes a, a fair bit of effort to 
entirely destroy these things. Next is the Annihilation Barge, power level 8, 133 points. Uh, the Twin, the Gauls Cannon you have to pay for, first of all, is 20 points. It's about 150 points so far. And then the Twin Tesla Destructor is zero, actually. It's about 150 odd points for this. Add uh, 12 inch move, weapon skill 6 plus, 3 plus ballistic skill, strength 5, toughness 6, 8 wounds. Three attacks, Lich 10, four up, so. The Gauls Cannon we've seen. The Twin Death Tesla Destructor is Assault 8. So there's no minus here for your movement with this. Range 24, Strength 7, any 6s, 6 plus, then you get 3 hits instead of 1. So pretty good for a lot of firepower. Even on vehicles, just force them to make lots of saves, except Strength 7. Uh, you may replace the Gauls Cannon with a Tesla Cannon. We've seen that already. It's Assault 3. Uh, again, same principle, sixes to hit is three hits instead of one. Quantum shielding to protect it and explodes. Um, yeah, so right. Yeah, it's okay. Just the, it's no minus at all. It's the downside for Tesla. So, sort of, sort of a general all round of its firepower. I don't think it's worth 150 odd points, so. so not so good with that one. You've got the Doomsday Arc next, that's power level 10. It's 193 points. Uh, of course, Flare Arrays, zero points to the Gauls Flare Arrays. And then the Doomsday Cannon is zero as well, so this is just a flat 198 points. Um, so you've got to choose your profiles, so low power, range 36, heavy d6, so a very random number of shots, strength 8 minus 2 and d3 damage, it's nasty enough. And you can go for high power, uh, which is range 72, heavy d6, strength 10 minus 5 and d6 damage. The model can only fire the Doomsday can at high power if it remains stationary in its preceding movement phase. There's, there's a pretty good advantage now in 8th edition because you don't have to keep pivoting your vehicle around or manoeuvring it as such. For example, you have your vehicle and it's uh, only part of it sticking out from cover and there's a target around here. Or only part of that model needs to see the target. You don't have to swing the whole vehicle around anymore and line the weapons up. So that's a better advantage now for the Doomsday Arc and 8th edition. I mean, it's pretty good. It's, it's 14 wounds in this thing. Strength 6, toughness 6. 4 plus save. You can bend, you can Help that out by uh, obscuring it behind cover to give you a free up save. So, uh, your damage then, uh, between 8 and 14 wounds, movement 12, ballistic skill 3 plus, uh, and then you drop down to 4 plus, 5 plus, movement 8 and 4. Um, that's if you drop down between 4 and 7 wounds and 1 and 3. It's quite random though, Some, sometimes you're just going to miss entirely, roll one shot and miss. Other times you can get six shots and cause absolute havoc. Yeah. I think it's worth it. I think it's gonna it's gonna absorb a lot of hits. 14 wounds is a lot. It's got living metal. It has quantum shielding, so the heavier weapons that your opponent fires, like las cannons and so on, you've got a good chance of just nullifying those effects. So durable enough, a deadly weapon. Explodes and hovering rolls just there. Yeah, I'd say the Doomsday Arc isn't too bad. It's pretty good. Yeah. That'll kill a. If you roll well enough, it'll kill a tank in one round of high power. With high power. Yep. I'll smash a tank up pretty bad. That's a nasty weapon on that. The Doomsday Arc. There's something to be feared. AP minus 5. Oh, so the head, you know, tank and cover, it's just going to bypass everything. Pure uh, round coming through, d6 damage. As soon as you get 2d6 damage, 3d6 damage, that vehicle, whatever it is, is in big, big trouble. And then you, there's, there's definitely a high chance of doing it. Strength 10, you'll be on freeze to wound uh, pretty much everything. Yep, pretty much every type of vehicle. Land Raiders and so on. And once you get them wounds, Minus five, deadly. 
gets a break to doom start. You need heavy firepower, it's about the best there is. Uh, the transcendent katan. You know, you can definitely have a couple of um, a cryptic nearby or the spiders nearby and just D3 repairing wounds and so on. Definitely a good idea. Uh, the transcendent katan. Which is here, 225 points. It's uh, crackling tendrils, zero points. That's your, just over 200 then. The transcendent katan. This is the uh, spaghetti monster, isn't it? Yes, right. Let's see what he does. Movement eight for, <laughs> for him. Weapon skill 2 plus, ballistic skill 2 plus, strength 7, toughness 7. 8 wounds, he's a character. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to get rid of. Um, 4 attacks, leaves a 10 and 4 up save. God, he's not to be trifled with. God, he's nasty. Melee, uh, strength for the user, strength 7, AP minus 4, and D6 damage. Oh, it's horrid. He really is nasty. Um, four up in one save. He knows two powers of the Katan. And it can use one of its powers at the end of each movement phase. Reality unravels. If he dies, there's trouble. Uh, he can never have a wall trait. Fractured personality. Before the battle, you can pick one of the abilities opposite to apply to this model for the duration of the battle. Alternatively, you can roll 2d6 to randomly determine two abilities and apply them both to this model. Interesting. Okay, so... He can have Cosmic Tyrant. This model can use two different powers of Katan at the end of each movement phase instead of one. Cool. Uh, immune to natural law. Add one to the saving throws of this model, so free up save. Uh, now, uh, there's a question that we've had. Yeah. Plus one to... Yeah, right, this is interesting. See what you think about this. This is what I've heard. Uh, plus one to saving throws. Not armor saves. This one has a four plus invulnerable save. So I think immune to natural law gives him plus one to his saving throws for armor and invuns. Which means he goes up to three plus invun save. He's looking pretty good here. Sentient necrodermis. Uh, this model regains d3 loss wounds uh, at each of your turns. Wow, this is all really good. Transdimensional displacement. When this model advances, add 12 to its move characteristic for the movement phase instead of rolling a dice. Very good. And then entropic touch. Reroll found wound rolls in this model for the fight phase. Very good. Riving worldscape. Enemy units do not receive a bonus for their saving throws for being in cover whilst within 12 inches of this model. That's probably the weaker one. Because he himself doesn't have any shooting. Yeah, I would probably roll for these and just go for the two. But overall, he is uh, deadly. And the, in the pictures, the model doesn't look very good, but in in reality, the model looks pretty cool. When you actually see it on the battlefield, I saw one quite recently, looked pretty cool. Uh, but he's nasty enough. You don't have to paint him green. I think you could paint him <laughs> some other colour if you if you wanted to. Right, so uh, Ghost Dark is next. Always love the model for these. Uh, it's 160 points. I think that's it, because you've got your flare arrays, but they're free of charge. It's just a straight 160 points. It is expensive for a transport, but it's pretty tough. Uh, four to the 14 wounds on here uh, has the quantum shielding to protect it, so they're quite hard and frustrating to try and bring down. Uh, living metal available. Gauze flare arrays, range 24. Rapid fire, five, so five shots. Uh, no, it works differently now. Five shots or ten shots within 12, but you've got two sets, and now you don't need to do up uh, firing angles and so on. So in fact, you're going to fire ten shots in total or 20 shots within 12, at whatever angle you decide to fire it. So it's the equivalent of a 10-man squad. Yeah, the firepower available from this thing. With quantum shield. Hovering, uh, I've covered that already and explodes. So, repair barge. You can make reanimation protocols for any slain models from this unit embarked on a ghost stock, even though they're not on the battlefield. So, you're able to do your reanimation safely inside there. 
transport capacity is 10 dynasty infantry models, uh, which must be warriors or characters, cannot transport destroyer lords. So you can make reanimation protocols. <laughs> if they didn't say that, if they didn't clarify it, you can't put destroyer lords in there. You can imagine people just <laughs> putting a load of destroyer lords inside this. Uh, you can make reanimation protocol rolls for any slain models. That cover that. Any models returned to the unit this way are added to the number of models embarked in the ghost arc. If any models cannot be returned because there is no more room for them in the ghost arc, they're not returned. For example, you've got a, a busted unit. It used to be 20 strong. You put five of them inside and then you, you gradually repair a load of them. You can't go over your transport capacity, even though it's a large unit orig and ir originally it's inside. In addition, at the end of your movement phase, you can make reanimation protocols for slain models from Dynasty Warrior units within three inches of any friendly ghost arcs. You cannot use this ability on a unit that has been the target of Resurrection Orb or the Orb of Eternity this turn. Basically, you do uh, your reanimations, start your turn um, as usual, and you can do it for units inside. And then, on top of that, uh, you get to reanimate again for Warrior units within three inches of the ghost arc. So it's reanimate and then reanimate again. So, uh, it's pretty good. It's just verified. So you're just getting a double chance to reanimate. It's helpful if you're a fan of Necron Warriors. It's pretty good. The beginning of your turn, yeah. So, you've got a Necron Warrior unit nearby, unit 20. They've taken 16 casualties. Start of your turn, you reanimate as usual. And you get five back. And then at the end of your movement phase, you reanimate again if they're in three inches of him. So and you've got a crypt tech nearby. So that unit, you know, four plus to reanimate, and then four plus to reanimate again, you're gonna bring back about 75% of your losses. Which is good. It is good. So there's value to the ghost stock for sure. They look great when there's more than one of them as well. One looks okay, but like two of them moving around just looks very cool. So, Ghost Arc's good. And, and tough enough, you fire a load of laser cans, that's it, and then all of a sudden, using your um, quantum shielding, you can just ignore bad results that come through if you roll well enough. So, we're on to, uh, that's transports, just the one available. And then we're on to uh, flyers now, so there's two options. The first is the uh, Doom side. It's 205 points. It comes to the death ray, which is zero, and then you've got to pay for a twin Tesla Destructor, which is zero as well. So it's a flat 205. I really like this one, but there's one problem. Power level 11. Uh, strength for toughness 6, 12 wounds. There's a lot of wounds here. Free up saves. This decent stat line for a flyer. Um, your movement is 20 to 60, 3 plus ballistic skill and uh, 3 attacks. Then you drop a bracket, it's 20 to 40 inch move, 4 up ballistic skill, and then 1 to 3 wounds, 20 to 25 inches, slow right down, and it's 5 plus. The death ray is alright, it's range 24, the range isn't such a problem because you are able to move around so fast with a flyer. Heavy D3, so you could get one shot, you could get 3 of them. Strength 10 minus 4 on D6. It's all right, but there's going to be times you just get one shot and maybe miss. Living metal, it can repair itself. Airborne, hard to hit. Supersonic. There is no provision in here with the ballistic skill. You're a heavy weapon. So even at your four wounds, you have fours to hit. It just doesn't. It's a shame. There. But it's just not very good. And as soon as you start taking damage, you know, four plus to hit, and then you're on the move, you're always moving, you can't remain stationary. It becomes a 5 plus to hit. Oh dear. So your firepower is just not very efficient from this thing, and you've spent 200 points on it. So I don't, it's a shame, but I, I can't see the point of taking one. It's not very reliable. Uh, the night side then is your transport option. 160 points, there's no other extras to pay, it's still expensive enough. Two Tesla Destructors, so that's, in total that's your eight shots for that. This is Assault Weaponry though, so you are only freeze to hit with this, and you can saturate the 
targets with lots of hits, but against strength 7 there's no minus on the AP and it's only 1 damage. It's not very deadly. Uh, same stat line as above. Living Metal, uh, Airborne, Hard to Hit, Supersonic, Crash and Burn, and then the Invasion Beams rules. When you set up this model, put it on the battlefield, at the same time you can also set up any number of friendly Dynasty Infantry units on their Tomb World, so you can keep them off the board, rather than set them up on the battlefield. It's any Infantry units, this could be Lich Guard for example. Before this model moves in your movement phase, so you disembark before you move off, a single friendly Dynasty unit that was set up on their Tomb World can be beamed onto the battlefield by the Knight of Scythe. Set up that unit so that it's wholly within 3 inches of this model, and more than 1 inch from enemy models. If all Dynasty Knight Scythe are monoliths from your army destroyed, uh, the unit counts as slain. So pretty good. You look in, so you say you've got a combat based unit, you're looking to just fly straight at the heart of the opponent, or whatever target it might be in combat, and to be over the top of the enemy uh, army, and then survive the incoming firepower, and then disembark next turn. And there you are, you've, you've got across the battlefield. Um, is it worth all of that for 160 points? Because the flyer itself is okay, but it's firepower's not that scary. So, and again, in 7th edition, you used to be able to swing around behind vehicles, strength 7 against rear armor 10. There's a decent chance you could cause trouble uh, by shooting up models on their vulnerable side and rear armor, but not anymore. You can chip off wounds, but that's about all you can expect. So that's taken a knock, I think. So not so sure about the flies. It's a shame because they're so iconic. That crescent shape look great. So now you've got the... Uh, Lord of Wars here, the Obelisk and the Tesseract Vault. These are expensive. The Obelisk is 426 points. Not that much more expensive, really, than a monolith. And the Tesseract Vault is 496 points. That's a fair bit more expensive. So what do you get? Tw uh, power level 22 for the Obelisk. Um... Yeah, but first let's see what these can do. I've never really considered them before. Ben Hayes had one, looked really nice. Uh, let's see what it can do here. Range 13, you'll see it in the uh, Apocalypse, Necrons Apocalypse game that we did, we used it in that battle. Uh, so, 24 wounds, strength 8, toughness 8, free attacks, leadership 10, free up save. So just basically the same as a monolith, but with four extra wounds. Uh, your damage brackets then, is a half and then a quarter, so 13 to 24, 7 to 12, 1 to 6, and your movement drops from 8 down to 6 down to 4, ballistic skill goes from 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus, and the gravity pulse, check that in a moment, goes from 18 to 12 to 6. So the Tesla Sphere, range 24, assault 5, uh oh, Tesla Sphere, 0, right, so they don't cost anything, and that's it, right, so Tesla Spheres then, Oh dear. Yes. Assault 5, so you've got 4 of them. So you pick a target, you potentially could fire 20 shots at it. Any 6s to hit, 3 hits, strength 7, AP 0, and 1 damage. Not very scary. Living Metal. During deployment, you can set up this model in the upper atmosphere, right? So you can descend it down, you can be more than 12 inches away from any models. The gravity pulse, at the start of your shooting phase, roll D6 for each enemy unit that can fly and is within the distance specified on the damage table above. On a six, oh dear, on a six, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. Dreadful. The best range you can get is 18, then it drops to 12, then to six. <sighs> oh dear. Oh dear. Nope, it's official. I think the obelisk is dreadful. <laughs> Sorry. I can't see any. Oh dear. Nope. Dreadful, I'm afraid. I, maybe you think I've been harsh, but nice model, but shocking. Uh, power 25, power level 25 for the Tesseract Vault next. So this one's nigh on 500 points. Comes with the four Tesla Spheres, so that's it. So 496 points. So if you're doing 2000 point army, this is a quarter of your force here. So you're lining this thing up against something like an Imperial Knight. Uh, a Wraith Knight, this is the kind of level that we're at here. Um, so what do you get? Strength 8, toughness 7 though, 
This is the open one, so it's not as tough. Uh, it looks incredible though, it really does look good. Very big, massive presence on the battlefield. 28 wounds though, 28 wounds. Free attack, clear your 10, free up, save. Uh, stats, same as above, except it's powers the katan here. It drops, goes from three to two to one. Test of spheres we've seen, living metal. This model knows four powers of the katan. It can use a number of katan powers to the damage chart, right? So on, when you're at full strength, it's three powers a turn, then two, then one. Uh, it has a four plus invun save. Wow, tough. Yep. And the vengeance of the enchained. This model was reduced to zero wounds. Raw D6 for removing it from the battlefield. And a four plus, the katan contained within takes their vengeance. Each unit within two D6 suffers D6 mortal wounds. Ouch. That really is painful. Okay, so this is something you want to. No, it's not. You can't descend it down. This is something you want to set up away from your army because <laughs> you don't want to be near it if the katan goes nuts. Um, right. So remember, we looked at the katan powers on page 113. And remember, there was bonuses there. Plus, what we'll add one to the roll, we'll add one to the roll if it's all in Tesseract Vaults. It's a real enhancement there uh, if you use those powers from inside that. That one's better than that. That one's a bit more scary. It's tough enough, 28 wounds, four up in one save, it can repair itself, and then loads of katan powers and a chunk of firepower as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a deadly distraction for sure. The opponent can't ignore it, and then he's got to try and work his way through all of those wounds and all the invun saves and so on. So Tesseract Vault, I imagine, would be a pain. What if you charge it? You're gonna uh, no, not really. If you charge it here, look, it's got fly. Um, so that means you can pull out and still shoot. So not really going to be affected in combat at all. And that's it. That's the last of the units there. We've gone through all of these, covered all of these rules here, and the stats as we've gone along. It's a great showcase here for the Necrons. Yep. And then we're on to the extra rules now. So we've got things like dynastic codes to cover and uh, warlord traits and so on. So, Code of War, uh, the objective secured for all the troops, just as usual, and then Dynastic Codes, yeah, so your codes is here, it's like your chapter, Space Marine chapters, similar to that. Um, some of the units uh, listed below never themselves benefit from a Dynastic Code, oh right, so some of the exclusive models here. Uh, Katan Shards, Triarch Stalkers, Triarch Praetorians, interesting, Luminor Xeris and Anrikiar the Traveller. They don't benefit from any of these. Yeah. Okay. So Triarch Praetorians don't get that. Or the Stalkers. So you have to remember that, it's easily forgotten in the middle of a game. So you've got to choose who you're going to go for here. Sawtech then is the first one. If unit of this code advances, it treats all ranged weapons it is equipped with as assault weapons until the end of the turn. So if you want to be able to move quickly with your infantry and still fire, this one's pretty good. Rapid fire weapons are treated as assault one weapon. A heavy D6 weapon is treated as assault D6. So you, okay. Uh, in addition, unless it has advanced this turn, a unit of this code does not suffer the penalty to hit rolls moving and firing a heavy weapon. Right, so on the move. If you're on the move, that's a good one to go for. Uh, Mephrit, Solar Fury. This is the one that I like here. Yeah. Each time model of this code shoots an enemy unit that is within half the range of its maximum weapon. Uh, weapon's maximum range. So say, for example, a Gore's Flayer is range 12. If you're within range, uh, it's range 24. If you're then within range 12, half the range, the arm penetration characteristic of that weapon's attack is improved by one. For example, uh, AP characteristic of zero becomes AP minus one. An arm penetration characteristic of minus one becomes minus two. So a gauze flare, minus one, get it in range 12. It's 
minus 2. A gauze blaster, minus 2. Get to range 12, it's minus 3. Sounds like I'm calling out a bingo. <laughs> Thanks, saying that. Um, but anyway. Um, so anyway, I think that's quite cool. So get nice and close, and then tons of rapid fire and, and heavy minuses from uh, yeah, the armor saves. I think it's pretty good. I do want the Necrons to get within the middle of the board and start rapid firing uh, enemy units. The overall strategy of these is to uh, lock horns with uh, combat based armies with, with close combat units and then pulling out a mass firepower in, reducing units down and then for defensive armies like guard and so on, a grinding advance taking and absorbing the damage, reanimating, and then closing in for the kill, getting up close and personal. Um, so that kind of firepower, that makes that firepower really nasty. It's quite an easy rule to remember as well. Um, so, I, I, so, particle whips then, uh, Tesla spheres, Tesla destructors, all of these weapons get this as well. Hmm. Interesting. That one is pretty good. Each time a model with this code. It's, no, it doesn't say infantry. Yeah, no, pretty good. Yeah, I can't see why you'd not get it. You choose your dynasty. Dynasty, dynasty. It's all here. Yeah, Katana Shard doesn't have that Dynasty keyword in it. I think this is how it's working. Immortals, Dynasty, yeah, Lich Guard, Dynasty, they all have it here. So if I look up Praetorians, they shouldn't have Dynasty. No, they don't. All right, so the Stalker doesn't. Yeah, correct. All right, so that's the way that works. Yeah, that, that is really good. Yeah, I like, I like that one. Uh, so, Novok, Awakened by Murder. You can re-roll hit rolls of one in the fight phase for units of this code if they charged, were charged, or performed heroic intervention. That's okay, re-roll ones, but it's tame compared to that, I think. Uh, at Nihil Nihilak, aggressively territorial, re-roll rolls of one for units of this code whenever they shoot, including when firing Overwatch, as long as they did not move in the movement phase and they have not disembarked from a transport. It's quite restrictive, you're not allowed to move to get that. And again, it's quite tame compared to that. And the Nefrect translocation beams. If you knew this code advances, add six to its move for that movement phase instead of rolling a dice. If the unit is being affected by it, might will be done or wave of command ability, add seven to its move characteristic instead. In addition, if you knew this code advances, its models can move across models and trainers if they were not there. Again, that's okay if you're on the move, but this one here I I think is the powerful one. That one there is pretty good. Because, for example, I think there's gonna be times when I'm firing rapid fire weapons, cause flares, uh, cause blasters into vehicles, trying to ground them down. The average vehicle's gonna be free up save. Get nice and close. Those wounds that come through on five plus, gonna be on minus one, minus two, minus three. That's helpful. Definitely helpful. So I like the idea of this, that one there. Right, so now we're on to stratagems. I did say earlier that stratagems I think are pretty strong for the Necrons. Very helpful stratagems for them. And uh, pretty cheap in command points as well, as we'll see. But there's some really good ones here. So this is this is good news for the Necrons. I think the units are expensive. I've struggled with them. I don't hear of them being particularly successful army. But now with some nice tasty stratagems. Uh, hopefully there'll be uh, an army uh, that should do pretty good. So the first one then is enhanced reanimation protocols. It's two command points. Use this strategy before making reanimation protocols rolls for a unit from your army. You can re-roll reanimation protocols of one for that unit this turn. I don't think that's that great. It's only re-roll ones. You know, there's going to be a couple of them, and then you just get a chance to re-roll it, needing a five or a four plus. And it's two command points for that. So. I said they're good, that one's, <laughs> the first one's not that amazing. 
Uh, Wrath of the Catan, two command points. Use the stratagem. The good ones are sort of over here. Use the stratagem after Catan shard from Yami is resolved. A power of the Catan, roll d6 to randomly select a power of the Catan from page 113. Catan shard immediately uses the power rolled, even if it has already used that power this phase. So, again, it's okay, but it's random. You don't have much control over it, and again, it's two command points. Right, this is one of the good ones here. Emergency Invasion Beam. Use the stratagem when the last dynasty knight scythe or monolith from your army is destroyed. It's a nightmare scenario. You lose the last uh, knight scythe or monolith, and then you've got a unit that's stuck there on a tomb world, and usually, oh no, I've lost it, it's gone, destroyed. Before removing that model from the battlefield, you can immediately set up a friendly dynasty unit still on the tomb world, holding within three inches of the knight scythe monolith, more, more than one inches from enemy models. So no matter what happens, as long as you've got that command point, it's one command point, as long as you have that command point available, your opponent destroys in last night's Cyber Monolith, you still get to bring in a unit from uh, your Tomb World. That is very, very helpful. If you play that strategy, that worst case scenario now is no longer a big problem because of Emergency Invasion Beam. So that's brilliant. It's very, very helpful. Tactically, really helpful. Because, uh, you know, Necron units are expensive enough. Now you can compensate if the worst case situation happens. Amalgamated targeting data, one command point. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase. If a dynasty doom scythe from your army is within six inches of two other doom scythes, this is quite a formation here you've got to go for. Doom scythes cannot fire the death rays this phase. Instead, select a point on the battlefield within 24 of all three vehicles that is visible to all of them. Roll a d6 for each unit within three inches of that point. Add one to the result with the unit being rolled for us five more models. Minus one if it's a character. And four plus, that unit suffers 3d3 mortal wounds. So that's going to be between three and nine mortal wounds. Yep. So, do you know, I, I've got a theory here. I've just thought of it. And uh, the popular thing in 8th edition now is to go for these Death Star, not so much units, but Death Star sort of clusters. And I've seen it in the Cat Tower Codex. I've seen it here now. Uh, very strong uh, deterrence of clustering multiple units and characters together. Because this is where this is most effective. You know, say you've got like one, two, three characters, one, two, three units all clustered in this area, and then you strike that with this amalgamated targeted data. Uh, it's massive trouble. I mean, if a character does get hit, it's going to take 3d3 more to win. You're going to kill it. Most characters are going to kill them straight off there. Vehicle, vehicles, infantry, and uh, deadly. Uh, deep, deep, deep trouble. So that's nasty enough. But it's about 650 points worth of your models just to do that. So whether it's worth, <laughs> whether it's worth doing it or not, uh, you've got to. You have to take three of the doom scythes in order to achieve uh, or have the opportunity to do that. It's deadly enough, but costing you a lot of points to do it. Next one is uh, Dynastic Heirlooms, that's just you purchasing your extra uh, relics. Uh, the usual rules for that. Enhanced Invasion Beam, one command point. Use the stratagem before you set up a unit from a Tomb World using Invasion Beam's ability of a Knight side from your army, or the Eternity Gate ability from Modolith. You can set up two units from a Tomb World instead of one. Fantastic, really, really good. Brilliant. Yep. I wonder if you're allowed to... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you can combine it with that. So you've got two units caught out on the two. Well, can you bring them both in by combining those two? I don't, I don't think you can. Um, but uh, anyway, you can bring in two units from your two world just with one command point for enhanced invasion beams. Nice. So that one's a really good one. It's a really good sort of tactical ones here. Uh, one command point for solar pulse. Use the stratagem after a Necron's unit from your army has declared its targets in the shooting phase, but before any hit rolls are made, pick one of the enemy units that your unit is targeting. The enemy unit does not receive the benefit of cover against your unit's weapons this phase. So, not denying cover. Uh, it's just one common point. Resurrection Protocols. Use the stratagem when a Necron's character from your army, excluding uh, Trezian the Infinite and Catan Shards, is slain. At the end of that phase, roll d6 on a 4+, set up the character again, as close as possible to his previous position, more than one inch of enemy models, with one wound remaining. 
This stratagem cannot be used to resurrect the same model more than once per battle. So, resurrection protocols bring a character back. Yeah, it's pretty good. It really is good. I mean, yes, you only may have one wound left, but, you know, that character may have living metal, so you can start to get wounds back, and you may have, like, a, a cryptic or something nearby that can help out restoring wounds quickly. So you can get your character back there on a 4+. Plus. And it's just a command point. So, all adding to the durability there. So, I, I think these are great. I think these are really helpful. Uh, so, uh, one command point here for damage control override. Use this strategy at the start of any turn. Pick an Ekron's vehicle from your army. To the end of this turn, use the top row of the damage chart. Brilliant. Really helpful. Got a monolith on one wound left. One command point, fire at your normal rate. Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, repair subroutines. Two command points for this one. Uh, use this strategy at the start of your turn before making any reanimation protocols. Select a canoptic unit from your army that is on the battlefield. That unit gains reanimation protocols. Unbelievable. Absolutely fantastic. It's a unit of wraiths, for example. You've got one wraith left. Usually that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. For two command points, all of a sudden you can re start reanimating them. <laughs> this is fantastic. It really is good. So I'm liking the idea of reanimation protocol units. Um, and now the sphere of, of what units can have that suddenly expanded to a load, a load of extra ones. You know, scarabs, wraiths, tomb spiders, possibly, uh, I think. Just see how many, just see how this works. Yep. Yeah, if you take a multiple sized unit. Canoptic. Yep. So you've got a unit of three of them. You've lost two. You can try and reanimate them. Reanimate spiders. And with reanimation, you get your four wounds back. Four wounds. And it's for uh, two, two command points. So these, these are very, very powerful. Really good. Self-destruction. This one's weird. Uh, use the stratagem after unit canoptic spiders from your army piles in. Before they make their close combat attack, select a scarab swarm model in your army, in your unit, then pick an enemy unit of an inch. Your canoptic scarab swarm model is destroyed. Remove it from the battlefield, roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, the enemy unit takes d3 mortal wounds. Yeah, that's a bit scary, that. Yeah, it's, just, it's almost tempting to take a very small unit of them just to pull that one off. You could scare a character with that. <laughs> T3 mortal wounds. Self-destruct. Interesting. Disruption fields. One command point. Use the strategy before a Necron's infantry unit from your army fights in the fight phase. Increase the strength characteristic of all models in that unit by one to the end of the phase. That one's brilliant. Necron's infantry. I'll tell you why it's really good. Let's say you've charged into a tank with a unit of, uh, let's give you an example, Lich Guard, armed with war scythes. You find it strength 7. For one command point, you fight at strength 8. So then instead of 4s to end, you become 3s to end. And that's the massive difference that simple command point can make. So, really helpful. Some great, helpful stratagems here. And they're all these are all really, really good. It's probably, in my opinion, it's probably one of the best sets of, you may disagree, but I think it's one of the best sets of stratagems I've seen so far. It really helps the Necrons out. In, in Tropic Strike, next, one command point. Use the stratagem in the fight phase before a Necron's character in your army fights. Invun saves cannot be taken against the first close combat attack made by this character this phase. So an attack coming through, not all of your attacks, but one attack. Helpful enough. Yeah, might may find yourself in a situation your opponent's called decent in one save, you can just ignore it. So nasty enough. Dispersion shield amplification and uh, Necron players are really and fans of Lich Guard will be really happy to see this. Two command points. Use the strategy in the shooting phase when an enemy t unit targets a unit of Lich Guard from your army, equipped with dispersion shields. Your unit's invon save is improved by three plus improved to a three plus to the end of the phase. So you think, right, I've got my Lich Guard, they're going to take a hammering, they, they start to be shot at, you activate this. It is two command points, 
uh, but you get your 3 up in one. In addition to the end of the phase, each time you roll an unmodified roll of a 6, the in one saving throw, the unit that made that attack suffers a mortal wound after it's finished making all of its shooting attacks, so you, you can hit back with mortal wounds. Yeah. So what's scary about that, what's really scary about that is if you're forced to make loads and loads of saves. Because uh, if you roll tons of dice and start getting loads of sixes, you're going to hit your opponent back with tons of mortal wounds. <laughs> so it's pretty good. It's very good. And there might be a key point in the game where you know he's going to right, he's going to try and take out my Lich Guard. I've got a unit of ten. Uh, make your invent save three plus. Uh, one command point: Quantum Deflection. Use the stratagem when an enemy unit targets a vehicle in your army. That's Quantum Shielding ability before they're making hit rolls. The end of the phase, subtract one from the rolls made for your vehicle's quantum shielding. So remember you're trying to roll under the damage amount. Um, so you need to roll under three, you need one or two, you get a further minus one on that with this help for each of the damages that comes through. And again, trying to help keep it, the vehicle alive. Uh, yeah, to ruin your roll to see if the damage is ignored for each on save win. Okay. So that one's helpful as well. Uh, extermination protocols. Use it's one command point. Use a stratagem in your shooting phase before shooting with a destroyer lord or a unit of a unit of destroyers or a unit of heavy destroyers in your army. Reroll foul hit and wound rolls for that unit to the end of the phase. <gasps> oh, that is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's just unbelievable. Unit destroyers. Reroll found hit and wound rolls to that unit to the end of the phase, and all it costs is a command point. If uh, that is unbelievable. I had skipped though, I've, I have read through this one, uh, but I've skipped the uh, the impact of this. <laughs> I have a unit of three destroyers. <laughs> Might be tempted to get some more because that is utterly, utterly ridiculous. For example, regular destroyers. Um, the ghouls can have strength six, right? So most vehicles it's going to be fives to wound, but all of a sudden, re-rolling your wounds is um, is incredible because the danger is trying to get the wounds. Five plus is hard, but if it's re-rolls, you're going to get a lot more wounds coming through. And then once you get those wounds, you're then on to minus three AP and D3 damage. So destroyers are deadly now against vehicles with the help of that stratagem. And the ghouls can, you know, strength nine freeze to end, re-rollable, re-roll to hit. Suddenly, and you, you know, there's no minuses when you're on the move. So my recommendation: take a destroyer unit, give one of them a heavy ghouls cannon, and you've got yourself a very mobile. Very accurate and very deadly firepower for 150 points. Oh yes, <gasps> and they have reanimation protocols. All of a, all of a sudden, they like destroyers, which is good because they've been in the box unused for literally years. So now this is. Um, this is without doubt the, the most powerful stratagems I've ever seen. So, I, maybe as you, you've not heard of any, this is you know this is all fresh. You've not seen any of the rumours and so on. And you're a Necron player. I mean, I'm, I I can't see why you wouldn't be excited. <laughs> this is incredible. It must be a typo or something <laughs> because reroll hits some wounds. Right, we must move on. The Phaeron's will. Use the stratagem and look. There's another page of them after this. You know, I, I've read through codexes and I've seen stratagems and they're sort of tiny little bonuses and it's sort of a waste of time, why would you bother? But they, they, most of these are fantastic. It re they really are good. Right, the Phaeron's Will. And for another stress to you, because this is a Tactica video, uh, you've got some destroyers, right? You take casualties, you've got one left. They're so quick, you can just swing them around behind something, hide, reanimate yourself, get a crypt tech to help out, resurrection orb and so on. Get them fresh again, swing them back out and start firing. You know, and be strong towards the end of a game. 
I'll just take big units of six, for 300 points, or units of five even. Units of five, you know, you're gonna get 15 shots at a time. Yeah, yeah, bigger units is more efficient for your um, stratagems. Right, the Pharaoh's will. Use this one command point. Use this stratagem after an overlord from your army is used. My will be done. A wave of command. The model can immediately use that ability for a second time. I think just unbelievable. So again, this Pharaoh's will, where uh, you get your my will be done again. I think the key for the Necrons is to concede the fact you're not going to be able to do multiple small units. And so to amplify and make the best use of your reanimation protocols and to get the most out of your stratagems is to go for larger units. And just accept the fact you're going to mess up on morale sometimes. I think. Because again, my will be done, you put it on a larger unit it's a bigger bonus than on a small unit. You know, you've got um, 20 Necron Warriors, 3 plus to hit with your shooting, uh, rapid fire range, oh, 40 shots, give them plus 1, 2's to hit with those shots, unbelievable. You then take your Dynasty, within 12 it's AP minus 2 and your weapons, horrific. Adaptive subroutines. Uh, one command point. Use the stratagem after a canoptic unit for army is advanced. The unit can still shoot and and or charge. Oh, amazing. So Rafe's now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Just so cheap. So that's what. See, I I, I got the codex through from Games Workshop. Uh, I looked through the units, and it's all pretty much the same. They look through the points, it's, like, oh, it's still expensive, so this is really bad. Necrons are, are, are stuffed here, they're in trouble. And then got to the um, stratagems, and it's just so, so powerful. It really helped out here. So, uh, the dimensional corridor uh, next is one command point. Use the stratagem at the start of your movement phase. Select a dynasty infantry unit from your army that is more than an instrument enemy. Uh, from enemy models and remove it from the battlefield. Then set up the unit again so that it is wholly within three inches of a dynasty monolith from your army and more than an inch from enemy models. That unit counts as having disembarked from the monolith. This turn and can move normally. Brilliant. Oh, so when you deploy by a monolith, it does count as disembarkation. So you can move so on. Uh, so this is great. So you can pull out uh, of wherever you are, even from combat. Nope, sorry. You have to be more than an inch away from enemy models. Okay, so you got to you, for wherever you are. It's the old, it's the old rules basically. You, you got in with the unit, but now it's a stratagem. Um, you pull that unit away from the battlefields wherever it is, and you turn up near the monolith. So I like monoliths. There's one command point to do that, and that's nice, flexible tactics available here. Yeah, interesting. Judgment of the Triarch. Next is one command point. Use your stratagem before a unit of Triarch Praetorians from your army shoots in the shooting phase or fights in the fight phase. Add one to hit rolls made for this unit until the end of the phase. Brilliant. Excellent. Really good. Yeah. R really good. Okay. Gravatic Singularity. Use your stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select an obelisk from your army and resolve in this model's gravity pulse ability this turn. Each enemy unit to be in range that can fly suffers d3 mortal wounds or a 4 plus instead of a 6. Right, so that helps to some degree. That's not bad. But usually, I imagine the opponent's going to fly around the zone, the no fly zone. <laughs> so, I don't think it's that. Still, I don't think that's that great. Cosmic powers. Use this one command point. Use a strategy at the start of movement phase. Select a Katan shard from your army. That model can replace one of its powers of the Katan. With a different power of the katana, good choice. It's one command point just to change it around. Helpful enough. Methodical destruction, use a stratagem. This is two command points. Oh, we're onto some uh, dynasty specific ones now. Use a stratagem after a cell tech unit from your army is inflicted an unsaved wound on an enemy unit. Add one to any hit rolls of friendly cell tech units that target the same enemy unit this phase. Brilliant. Really good. There is a powered, highly powered unit, highly powerful unit, or a certain a nasty unit of some kind has to go, you know you're going to fire lots of uh, units at it, then play that. Cool. 
uh, reclaim a lost empire. This is uh, Nihilak Stratagem. Two command points. Use the stratagem at the end of your turn. Select a uh, uh, Nihilak unit from your army. If the unit is in three inches of an objective marker, or if it did not move for any reason during its turn, the unit then until the start of your next turn, you can add one to the saving throws made for that unit. Increase the attacks characteristic of the model of models in that unit by one. Wow. Cool. Plus one to your saving throws. Nice. So I wonder if you can combine that with your plus one invun save for your Lich Guard to effectively give you a 2 plus in button on an objective and if you haven't moved. Translation crypt 1 command point. Use the stratagem during deployment. You can set up a Nephrek infantry or swarm unit from your army in a translocation crypt instead of placing it on the battlefield. At the end of any of your movement phases, this unit can translocate into battle. Set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than 9 inches away from enemy models. Cool. Let's ambush. Good. Uh, blood rights is three command points. This is for Novok. Use the strategy at the end of the fight phase. Uh, the unit can fight again. Great. And then talent for annihilation. One command point. Use the strategy before a myth. Right unit from your army attacks in the shooting phase. Each time you make an unmodified hit roll of a six for a model in that unit, you can make an additional hit roll for that model with the same weapon against the same target. These additional hit rolls cannot themselves generate any further hit rolls. Okay, that's not bad. That's cheap, one command point. But no, those are excellent. Absolutely fantastic. Very, very powerful. Very helpful for the Necrons, for sure. So everything else is a bonus now. We've got Powers of the Guitar, which we've covered. So Artifacts of the Aeons. Interesting. So anything here that generates command points, I'm on the lookout for. And no one Ekron army is probably going to have a lower amount, perhaps six at the most, for a battalion. So any kind of help, because because I really like command points now <laughs> with these stratagems. So Orb of Eternity, model with a Resurrection Orb only. The Orb of Eternity replaces re the regular Resurrection Orb. If a model has the Orb of Eternity once per battle, immediately after you've made your reanimation protocols, you can make reanimation protocol rolls for models from a friendly infantry unit within three inches of the bearer. Now, when making these rolls, you add one to the result of each roll. Right, so plus one. Nice. Yeah, combine that with your Crypt Tag, you're looking at three pluses to resurrect. And these are free. Here, yeah, the army's battle forged. You take one for nothing, uh, and then you can pay extra command points to get more if you wish. The Void Reaper is a War Scythe or Void Scythe only. Void Reaper replaces the Bearer's War Scythe or Void Scythe. Uh, it is brilliant. Its strength, of the uh, no, sorry, strength is always wounds on a 2 plus, unless it's a vehicle, in which case it's strength 7. It's AP minus 4, and it's 3 damage. That is a decent weapon. Yeah, these are good here. Lightning Field. The bearer of the Lightning Field has a 4 plus invon save. In addition, roll a d6 each time uh, for each enemy unit within an inch of the bearer at the start of the fight phase, and a 4 plus itself is a mortal wound. That's okay. Uh, your average overlord's going to have an invon save anyway. Uh, it's the Nightmare Shroud. The bearer's save characteristic is improved by 1. Uh, so a 4 plus becomes a 3 plus. Okay. Um, in addition, enemy units subtract one from their leadership characteristic whilst they're in six of the bearer. So, basically, if you want to improve your arm save. So, again, stick that on a... Um, hmm. So, could you put that on a Catacoon Command Barge, I'm wondering? I suppose you can. Yeah, a character. Yes, it could. So you could have a 2 plus Catacoon Command Barge flying around. With average Necron Overlord. Uh, becomes a 2 plus. Nice. This is, these are all good here. Gauntlet of the Conflagrator. Uh, it's, it's pistol, 1, range 8. This weapon can only be 5 once per battle. This weapon automatically hits its target. Roll 1d6 for each model in the target unit that is within 8 of the firer. The unit suffers a mortal wound and a roll of a 6. 
So good against hordes there, trying to get lots of sixes to cause mortal wounds, it's okay. Uh, thanks to that power void to choose some, some of these other ones here. The Veil of Darkness next. Once per battle. At the end of your movement, because at the moment the average Necron Overlord is quite tame. So definitely help of these relics to give them a boost. Yeah, if you have an unnamed uh, Overlord, you can make them pretty good with some of these. Give them Nightmare Shroud, give them uh, the Void Reaper, for example. Orb of Eternity. Veil of Darkness. Once per battle, at the end of your movement phases, the bearer can use the Veil of Darkness. When they do, the bearer and up to one friendly dynasty infantry within three inches of the bearer are removed from the battlefield. Then set up the bearer and the second unit you choose, if any, anywhere on the battlefield, it's more than nine inches of any models. The second unit must be set up wholly within six inches of the bearer. So a bit of tactical uh, options there. It's free of charge. These are free to take. Uh, the Nano Scarab Casket. Models with phylactery only. The Nano Scarab Casket replaces phylactery. The bearer of the Nano Scarab Casket regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of your turn, rather than one, from the living metal ability. In addition, the bearer also regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of your opponent's turn. <laughs> the, the, the first time the bearer is slain, roll D6 on the 4 plus the bearer. Set up the bearer again at the end of the phase. As close as possible to its previous position, more than an inch of any models, D6 wounds remaining. It's utterly ridiculous. Now, um, I'm trying to see someone has this phylactery. Yes, it's him, isn't it? It's the Destroyer Lord. Unbelievable. Yep. If you're going for a Destroyer Lord, I mean, that's incredible. So, yeah, D3 lost wounds, beginning of your turn. Uh, then, D3 during your opponent's turn. 4 plus, getting back up again with D6 wounds. It's so powerful. So, you get a lot of opportunity here to take unnamed characters, you know, standard ones that you build up yourself. And make them really, really good. And cheap as well. Semper Internal Weave. Infantry model only. Increase the toughness and wounds characteristic of the pair by one. That's alright. Uh, Abyssal Staff. Soltec model with Staff of Light only. Replaces the Staff of Light. For shooting, it's Strength 12. Uh, sorry, Range 12, Assault 1. And then we'll see what comes up later. And then Melee. Uh, strength use AP minus 2 and 1 damage. This weapon auto hits its target. Roll 3d6 if a unit is hit by this weapon in the shooting phase. If the result is equal to a greater than the unit's highest leadership characteristic, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. So it's not bad. There's a good chance you're going to accomplish that. Time Splinter Cloak. Uh, the Nehelect model only. Once per battle, you can reroll a single hit roll, wound roll, or damage roll made for the bearer of the Time Splinter Cloak. In addition, you roll dice each time the bearer loses a wound. And a 5 plus. You don't lose them. That's all right. The Voltic, the Voltaic Staff. Uh, it's for Mephrit and it replaces Staff of Light. Uh, shooting, it's Assault 3, range 12, strength 6, minus 3, and 2 damage. And then uh, strength user, minus 2, and 1 damage in combat. Any sixes, any wounds of a 6 of this weapon in the shooting phase is a mortal wound. Plus the additional damage, usual damage. Blood Scythe, uh, the Navok model with Warsaw Void Scythe. Uh, you get plus two strength, AP minus four and two damage. Each time the bearer fights, you can make D3 additional attacks with this weapon. Nice, giving yourself a nice lot of extra attacks. That's pretty good. Solar Staff uh, replaces the bearer's Staff of Light. Strength, uh, range 12, Assault 6. Strength 5, AP minus 3, 1 damage. In melee, it's the usual. Each time an enemy infantry unit is hit by this weapon in the shooting phase, roll d6. On a 4 plus, the enemy unit is blinded to the end of the turn. It cannot fire overwatch, and your opponent must subtract 1 from any hit rolls made of the unit. That's nasty. Nasty. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, so all these are brilliant. It'd be difficult to choose which ones here. We can really give some good buffs to some of your unnamed characters with these, even with decent weapons. Granting better protection, healing abilities here, uh, 
shooting weapons are some pretty good ones. So, good. None of these generating extra command points. Hmm. Yeah, so it seems like battalions are going to be the best option. Brigade, you might struggle. Yeah, because, like, cheapest options, Necron Warriors, you have to take 10. It's doable, I think. Maybe battalion. Here, right, Warlord Traits. Next. So, uh, the first one is Enduring Will. Or of a 1, uh, which you can choose. Reduce any damage inflicted on your Warlord by 1 to a minimum of 1. For example, if your Warlord fails a saving throw against an attack that inflicts 3 damage, they take 2 instead. Uh, so, okay. If you really want your Warlord to be in the thick of the fighting, you know, destroy a Lord, for example, with a Wall Scythe, uh, then that's good. Eternal Madness, you can reroll Foul Wound rolls for your Warlord in the fight phase if you charged. Was charged or performed heroic intervention. Right. Immortal Pride. Uh, auto pass morale within six inches for units. In addition, your warlord can attempt to deny one psychic power in each psychic phase. That one's okay. For all of the Silent King, increase the range of all abilities on your warlord's data sheet by three inches. Cataclysm Command Barge has this warlord trait. This does not apply to its explodes ability. If a crypt tech has this warlord trait, only increase the range of the model's technomancer ability, not that of other crypt techs in your army. If a crypt tech with a canoptic cloak has this warlord trait, this does not affect the distance the cloak allows the model to move in the movement phase. Okay. Implacable Conqueror, you can reroll foul charge rolls for your units whilst there is six of your warlord. Very good if you're on the move and wanting to get stuck in. And then Honorable Combatant, if your warlord targets the same enemy character with all their close combat attacks, add D3 to your warlord's attacks characteristic to the end of the phase. Handy enough. Um. Yeah, I would say difficult one to choose from there. They're all okay-ish. Not really stand out. Maybe that first one. Reduce the damage coming through. So then you've got opportunity to take dynastic warlord traits here. So Sawtech. Once per battle, you can reroll a single. Yeah, yeah, I like this one. Yep. Once per battle, you can reroll a single hit roll, wound roll, or damage roll for your warlord. In addition, if your army's battle forge, if your warlord is on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem. On a 5+, plus, that command point is immediately refunded. Yes, it's per command point, not per stratagem, so that's a way of retaining some command points. Yeah, I like this one then. Yeah. I like Sawtech there, so I think. Just have a quick look. I think so. Relentless Advance. No, it's not. It's Mef Mefrit. Solar Fury is the good one. With the extra minus one on the AP. The Sawtech one is uh, assault weapons. Uh, rapid fire weapons as assault weapons. Heavy, heavy weapons and so on. Hmm. That's your opportunity to get command points back. That's annoying. Uh, Merciless Tyrant. Add six to the maximum range of all assault weapons fired by your Warlord. In, in addition, your warlord can shoot assault weapons at enemy characters, even if they're not the closest enemy model. Okay. Mm, it's not so great, I think. Uh, Precognitive pre Strike. Uh, your warlord always fights first in the fight phase if you didn't charge. Your opponent, ha if your opponent has units that have charged or have a similar ability, and you alternate to start the player's turn. It's taking place. Uh, that's for Nihilak. Uh, then Nefrek, your opponent must track one from hit rolls that target your warlord. That's the skin of living gold. <laughs> and then uh, Crimson Haze here for Novok. Your each time you roll an unmodified hit roll of a six in the fight phase for a model in a friendly Novok unit that's within six inches of your warlord, you can make an additional hit roll for that model with the same weapon against the same target. These additional hits cannot themselves create any further hit rolls. So they're okay. So I, I think maybe uh, battalion detachment and just be careful with your command points and stratagems. And a lot of them are only one point in each anyway. So if you choose them carefully and wisely, and don't use too many re-rolls up, then uh, you should be right. So 
So, that's points values. And then your tactical objectives, just that. Six uh, specific ones for the Necrons. And that's the review. So, uh, there's a lot to cover in here. There's a lot of units to choose from for the Necrons. Loads of HQs, uh, and all different units, different abilities. Uh, all quite similar to the index, it was, but uh, as we've seen, I think the most exciting part for these is those stratagems. That's what I think, I think they're really good. So know your stratagems for the Necrons, uh, and really you can build your strategy and your army around them, because uh, there's some very, 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 very helpful uh, ones available there uh, for the Necrons to use. So I think Necrons are still going to be expensive in points, um, they're still going to be quite an elite army, but I've taken a big enhancement here with this codex. Leave your own comments and feedback here, especially if you're an experienced Necron player. Do you think they've been helped now significantly? Uh, leave your own comments and feedback there. And as I mentioned, um, share uh, unit combinations and even army lists that have worked well for you in the past. We're fascinated to see what different uh, lists are out there that work well. Um, and you can talk about various victories and things that you've had. Uh, and then, you know, I can read through those comments and then others as well. There's going to be people here watching this who are interested in collecting Necrons, perhaps even those who are new to the hobby and thinking about getting into Necrons, which I would recommend because they're easy to paint and you can get a really atmospheric, cool looking army pretty effectively. Uh, follow the painting tutorial along uh, on the regular channel and that will show you how to paint the Necrons up. And then keep a lookout for Necrons. I really want to get these. Uh, a really effective, nicely themed list for these. An army to be feared. An army that just, you, you kill them and they just keep coming back, coming back. Great theme to have for the Necrons. So keep a lookout for them. Uh, any future announcements for a list will be on the Plus channel in Army Development. You'll see that army being developed. And then you can even leave your own comments and feedback and have an input into the development of the new Necron list. It may be a dramatic change. As we've seen, a lot of the old units are liked. I don't think of that great anymore. Tomb Blades uh, and so on. And so it may be the time for a shift to try out some new units, but we'll see. Uh, but thanks to Games Workshop for sending the book early and uh, you can get the book from them. I usually get mine from gamingfigures.com. Check them out for Games Workshop uh, stuff and other gaming systems at a discounted rate. But there it is, that's the review for the Necrons Codex. Uh, it's great to see them get in their codex here. And I think overall it's pretty good, uh, but uh, Right, or leave your own feedback in the comments section below. There it is. That's the video. Thanks for watching and tune in next time.